Hi. It's really it's lovely um, to welcome all of you here to here to SOAS. Um, yeah, I'm Graham. Oh, I'm the Dean of Humanities, uh, and I'm also an archaeologist. Um, and also, I've spent all of my research career looking at the relationship between archaeology and cultural heritage and uh, technology. Um, both in the way that you might expect, which is, you know, how can we understand the past better by using technology? Um, but increasingly, and and in, in collaboration with, uh, actually with at least one of the people in the room, I'm also interested in the opposite direction, the ways in which the last quarter of a million years of human existence can inform the future of technology, the ways in which our technologies can be embedded, um, um, transformed by that appreciation of the diversity of human practice, existence, experience, imagination um, for a very long time. And so today is both my, you know, it's my duty, but it's also a joy to be here. Um, some thank yous. Thank you to all staff and students at SOAS who are here on for another day. You know, this is a busy time and, and we're very grateful that you've come to, to join us at, at the weekend. For those of you not from SOAS, we're very grateful to see you as well. We think that SOAS is a special place. We think that SOAS is a place where people come to have difficult conversations. And what we're having today is a big, difficult conversation. And we, and we try and do those difficult conversations at SOAS um, by listening and hearing and engaging in debate in a way that's caring, respectful and reflective. And that's what we are, that's what we're here um, to do. Um, the Centre of Buddhist Studies, which I know has been has been doing research, been funded to do research and teaching here for more than 20 years, kind of exemplifies, I think, this spirit. It draws on uh, academic expertise from all over all over the world. Um, has partnerships all over the world. I know the kind of the um, the uh, International Committee of the Red Cross, for example, as a, as a partnership. But then, crucially, is also so embedded and driven by partnerships locally um, in London and and, and across um, the UK. Um, I know, for example, that we've been supported by the British Mahabodhi Society um, and by the London Buddhist Vihara, and others and other partners, friends are, are represented in the audience, so we're, we're very grateful. My last thank you is to the Kensey um, Foundation, um, who are uh, very strong supporters of us as well, have enabled this event and indeed have enabled the Buddhism Inside Out um, and, and a variety of, of other, other things. Last thing is a bit anecdotal. I was on the train coming up this morning from Brighton. Brighton's full of interesting and creative and wonderful people, as, as is London. Um, and this person who I'd never met before said, goodness, you look very smart for a Saturday. And I said, yeah, I'm going to go and introduce a conference. And she said, what's that conference about? Uh, and I said, it's about Buddhism and AI. And they said, what? It's a conference about Buddhism and AI? We spent an hour talking on the train. And by the end of that conversation, it was, you're going to a conference on Buddhism and AI. Of course, you're going to a conference on Buddhism and AI. Because what we desperately need for AI is a reflection on its implications. We need an AI that is grounded in experience, critical, thoughtful, and different. And that's what um, here is, is all about. And so by the end of the conversation on the train, we both agree with each other. And they might not be here, um, but I think they'll be coming and working with, with us at SOAS at some point in the future. So thank you all very much for, for coming over to you, um, Stefania. Many things. Thank you so much, Graham, for being here on a Saturday and introducing this event. Um, and I also want to echo what you just said and thanks the Cancer Foundation it's behind me. And it's been not just behind me, behind the Center of Buddhist Studies for a very long time, supporting academic activities, seminars, but also activities like Buddhism Inside Out, this series, which is not just academic talking, is also opening the door of SOAS to a large audience, is trying to do outreach, to go out, to disseminate knowledge. So SOAS is, is an academic hub, but also want to be a reference point for many subjects for the population of London or England in general. So we are very grateful um, that we are allowed to do these kind of meetings here. This is a very special event for the Centre um, because it's the very first event of a new academic year. 
And it will be followed by, I think, another 10 events. And it will end it up in the end of May with another Buddhism Inside Out. Uh, so we are very looking forward to opening the door of SOAS to our students and the large public. We will be very much invited to come to any of our talks. If you go on the website of the SOAS Center of Buddhist Studies, you're going to find a link to join the mailing list. And then if you join it, um, Haruka, Saito, our fantastic center assistant, is going to give you notice uh, of all the activities that we are going to do now. And it's also a very special event because it's the very first collaboration, if I'm not mistaken, um, between the Center and the British Mahabodhi Society and the London Buddhist Vihara, the Graham already mentioned. And I'm extremely grateful to have here uh, Vante, the most venerable Bogoda uh, Salawimala and other members of the, um, of the Center of the Vihara and the uh, British Mahabodhi Society. And... Amal, that has been uh, my reference point that we have discussed this event, and I'm really, really grateful that we are doing this together, and I hope it's the first of many other activities together. And maybe something that we do together can also be hosted by, um, by the location of a British, um, of a Buddhist, London Buddhist Vihara. I don't know if you have been there. It's a fantastic place. It's very warm and friendly and peaceful. We have a nice library and very, very interesting talks. It's also a very good reference point for Buddhist practice. So I would all recommend you to check it out. Now, let's start and see, say something about this AI. So I'm going to say a few words to introduce the team, kind of food for thought, uh, questions that I have in my mind, some statements, some ideas that can open up the ground of a later conversation we are going to have today. AI has been... It's definitely in our present, will definitely be part of our future, has been also already part of our past, and has been treated and faced in very different ways, uh, celebrated as a sign of very important progress, but also feared. There is lots of fear about AI and a lot of suspicious about AI. So we have very, very different feelings about AI. Um, and if you check the news almost every day, there is something new about artificial intelligence. And the last thing that I was reading just a few days ago was the new Nobel Prize in Physics that has been given to Job Hopfield and Jeffrey Hinton. Jeffrey Hinton has been called the godfather of AI. And the godfather of AI that left Google, he was working at Google, left it um, because it felt like a, there is some danger in AI and he didn't feel much comfortable. And, and then he started, even when he received the Nobel Peace, uh, the Nobel, not the Nobel Peace Prize, the Nobel Prize in Physics, he has said that this AI can have uh, great consequences that can be a parallel to what happened with the Industrial Revolution. So it seems to be a new breakthrough, a kind of new industrial revolution, a new breakthrough in the history of humanity. Also something unknown as the industrial revolution was unknown at that time. When I look at AI, I think at AI as a machine, um, one of the many machines that we have had. So to me, it seems like something new in a path that we have been walking on before. And the kind of fear or dilemma that people have about AI is mostly about the relations between this machine or this AI and humans. There seems to be a very complicated relations. There is an article that was written in 2003 by one of my favorite author, Heather, Umberto Eco. Sorry, I'm Italian. I'm quoting an Italian. And he was discussing machines and the different... Um, groups of machine that you have. You have machine as extension of a human body. You have machine that are instrument for the human body. And you have machine that do things that the human body cannot do. So, for instance, the prosthetic is, is like doing something that the human body would do. You just, you cannot do it and, and you use this. But the hammer, you use a hammer because the human body could not be doing the same work. So this interface between the humans, the operator, and the machine is what is really the core of all the discussions that we have today. And the main problem is, can we control this machine? Can we, re be, we 
humans can be really be in control of a machine or is this machine that start replacing human i use the term machine in a very large sense can be acting independently and can a certain level of progress and development of ai transforming into a dehumanization of the relations between humans and machines so he wrote he said something in his article that has been picked up by scholars afterwards and have developed further this idea. He was not really talking about AI in his article. But I think this idea of AI as a machine and the problematic relations between the operator of the machine is at the core of everything. It's true that there are different kinds of AI, and we're going to hear more about that. There is, I have to read because I'm not an AI expert. Uh, there is analytical AI, human-inspired, humanized AI. So there are different kinds of AI that you can find if you start reading about AI. AI can think, a, artificial intelligence can think, apparently this is what I found, artificial intelligence cannot feel. We talk about intelligence, we are not talking about consciousness. So it seems that there is a big divide between the machine and the humans. So it's saying that AI can replace humans may not be possible because they lack a, some key feature of being human, like feeling, like being conscious. And it's very interesting when you read different debates. We have debates everywhere, public debates, scholarly debates about AI. Um, it's very interesting to see what Asians have to say about AI. And they have a very different perspective, especially if you look into East Asia. Of course, even in East Asia, you have a kind of top-down use of AI. So AI as a tool, and we see that everywhere, in the same way that AI is a tool in the West. However, AI is also seen as a partner. So they talk about collaboration, co-creation, creativity in a more pragmatic and, in my view, fruitful way. And somehow today we have to talk about Buddhism and, and Buddhism is not native of East Asia, but it's very much part of East Asia. And so this idea of partnering with AI could be also something that we see in Asia in general. So it'd be interesting to think maybe of AI, not just as a tool, but also as something different. Another, the big reason why we have all this discussion is the problem of ethics. No, hold on, I will keep this one for the time being. The problem of ethics. And even there, there have been the booming of handbook about ethics of artificial intelligence or similar topics. And even the distinction between AI ethics, machine ethics. So it seems to go very much into um, a detailed understanding of ethics. And many of the scholars or the intellectuals that have been part of the debates they say this somehow AI seems to be unethical. There is a problem with the ethics. And it's very interesting because ethics should be understood as a diverse and dynamic. So not just, we take ethics as something very human, as a monolithic human thing, but ethics is very much localized in time and space, it has to be diverse and dynamic. So why we cannot think of a, an ethical system where AI can also be part of? Here I have, um, my, I, I didn't introduce myself at the beginning, but there is my name in a certain point. I've been doing work on um, AI and Buddhism and AI, artificial intelligence and religion as part of my own interest about religion, media and technology. Here I just put some names and this name will come up later when we do our discussion. It's interesting to see scholars of religious studies, including scholars of Buddhism, that have been writing about AI. AI, again, as a tool, as a machine, AI as human or overhuman, AI as magic, AI as something that is maybe better than humans because AI are pure, purified. In many traditions, there is the idea of lack of purity as a problem, right? In Buddhism is also one of them. But AI seems to be purified of any humanness that sometimes are at the core of religious practice. So there have been very different views from these scholars when they were discussing um, AI and, and, and religion or AI and culture. And of course, it's not just scholars. Also, we have um, spiritual leaders 
from different religious traditions, Christianity, Islam, and Hinduism, and, and Buddhism, a lot to start talking about their own perspective from the root doctrine of how to understand how to use AI. So to have a conference about Buddhism and AI is not so strange because there is in the air, we have this discussion already going on. And I think only this year there have been, that I know of, at least four other events that discuss Buddhism and AI around the world. And this is what we want to do today. We want to have a very diversified conversation. I have been the first one to speak, and I will speak during uh, the entire event. As I said, I, I have an interest on Buddhism and AI. I also have a project in collaboration with my dear friend and colleague, Deborah Tonelli and Georgetown University, on Chinese perspectives on AI in global context to try to define a new ethical ecosystem where AI can be part of. And I say this is for me, working on AI is really the last step on, uh, oh, let's say the current step of a long-term research I've been doing on the interface between religion in China, especially Buddhism and media and technology. So my intervention in this uh, venue will be pretty much from this perspective. But we are very lucky to have four eminent speakers here. Mm -hmm. uh, we have Buddhist practitioners, we have intellectuals, we have experts of robotic engineer uh, who also know about Buddhism. So I'm going to introduce each of them. First one is Venerable Miao Guan Fa Shi from Foguanshan, Taiwan. Venerable And I'm personally very, very happy to be able to invite her here and to see her in London. We have known each other for so many years. Venerable Miao Guan is the personal English interpreter to the founder of the Foguanshan Buddhist Order, Venerable Master Xin Yun, who has been teaching and spreading the Dharma across all the five continents of the world for over five decades and passed away uh, at the beginning of last year. She graduated with a BA from the Department of Asian Studies of the University of New South Wales and went on to complete an MA in Buddhist Studies at Foguan University, focusing on the studies of Chinese Mahayana Buddhism, Buddhism in the 21st century, Buddhist text translation, and humanistic Buddhism, which is this Chinese-Taiwanese form of socially engaged Buddhism. She is currently serving at the Foguanshan Institute of Humanistic Buddhism as Deputy Chancellor for International Affairs and focus on research and studies of humanistic Buddhism, localization and acculturation of Foguanshan temples around the world. And she's super high tech. So she can say a lot. The, on the other side, we have Professor Venerable Mahinda Digalle. Emeritus from Bath University, and he has been a visiting scholar also at Cambridge after his retirement and a research associate also here at the Center of Buddhist Studies. He had a degree from Sri Lanka, Harvard, Chicago, and he held a number of very important visiting professorship and fellowship around the world from Kyoto to Canada. He has been the author of several works, translation works on Pali Buddhism, but also he has been very interested in Buddhism in today's world and Buddhism in connection with uh, challenges the society has today. We have been working together on a project on Buddhism and international humanitarian law in partnership with the International Committee of the Red Cross. But before, he has been writing about war and conflict and ethics on Buddhism. So he is an expert on ethics, uh, mostly from the Theravada perspective, but he is also a kind of outspoken um, uh, intellectual who has been invited by the BBC and a number of TV programs to discuss um, the topics of his expertise. Then next to Venerable Miao Guan, I have another dear friend of mine, uh, Professor Yan Wei Hong. He's a professor in the Department of Chinese Literature, National Jiangong University, Tainan, his scholarly interests go from Chinese Buddhism, Chinese philosophy, Buddhist ethics, and he has been working on a number of Buddhist texts. So he is a, is a Chinese Buddhist scholar, Taiwanese Buddhist scholars focusing on the Chinese tradition of Buddhism, but with a huge understanding of Abhidharma, for instance, as well. And we have a common interest in the study of Mahap Pranya Paramita um, Upadesha, Tajutulun, this particular text. 
Wei Hong is also a member of our research team in the collaboration that SOAS has with Georgetown University. So we have been discussing Buddhism and AI and also the issue of consciousness um, online for quite some time already. Last but not least, because he's a very, very important member of the panel today, is Professor Trishanta Nanayakara. He's a professor of robotics at Imperial College London, and he's also the director of Morph Lab. Uh, we have been supervising 18 PhD students. I don't know how you manage. You will have to tell me how you manage to do that. <laughs> In embodied intelligence of robots. Um, and more will come of his PhD students. He has authored more than 100 peer review publications on embodied intelligence and is the lead author of the world's first handbook on soft robotics to be published uh, at the end of his year. He also started Vipassana meditation um, 14 years ago at the Ar Amaravati Buddhist Monastery. And since then, he has been practicing under the guidance of a number of Buddhist monks. And he has, I have met him at the London Buddhist Vihara at the beginning of September, where he also gave a talk about Buddhism and AI. So we are extremely grateful to have, I don't want to say an AI voice, because <laughs> make you look like you're not human. Um, <laughs> But to have also someone who, because I, when I talk about AI, I have no idea how to create an AI, but now we have someone that can tell us exactly how much AI can be independent and how to create AI with also an understanding of Buddhism. So we are very looking forward to this conversation. And as I think I had mentioned in the advertisement, this wants to be a conversation. So we don't have formal paper. We are going to have, we are have a number of topics that we are going to discuss. And so we are going to go back and forth a conversation with us. And I have some slides that our speakers ask me to show when they are responding, addressing particular topics. But in the spirit of Buddhism Inside Out, this is a space also for you, especially for the people in the audience to ask questions. We are going to give them dedicated time uh, for the questions. But uh, if we are talking of something and you really want to make a comment or ask a questions, I would invite you to do so. Let's make it as interactive as possible. It would be maybe a little bit messy, uh, but probably not. And either me or Haruka, we are going to find you with a mic and so you can tell, ask your questions or make your comments. So uh, you are a speaker as much as all the people on this stage. This is what I wanted to say. We want to structure this round table into two main parts. The goal is, and we're gonna do it today, create a Buddhist AI. Probably we are not gonna do that by the end of the day, but we can set some foundations for further conversation about the topic. But before discussing how to create a Buddhist AI, we should say how Buddhism has embraced AI and how AI has affected Buddhism. So we started with some example of adoption of artificial intelligence by Buddhist groups and Buddhist practice. So we also talk about whether it's possible to use artificial intelligence in Buddhist practice and whether or not it is beneficial to Buddhist practice, whether there is compatibility or maybe lack of compatibility between Buddhism and AI. And a very important question is whenever Buddhists start using AI, did they really have been thought through of all the advantages, of disadvantages of the use of AI? So let's see how AI has been has become part of Buddhism and how Buddhism has been using AI. The second part, will we start with how to, how to rethink AI? Is it possible to reshape AI? Is it necessary to have a humanized AI? This is something that has been going on in a number of discussions recently as we needed to humanize AI uh, in, in name of ethics. May I say human ethics is kind of lots of flows as we have seen in the world. So maybe rethink a different ethical system may not be, um, may not be that bad, it may not be so necessary to humanize AI. But as another uh, venerable for, from Foguanshan once told me, venerable Chui Wei, uh, it's possible through AI to actually rehumanize us, so rethink our values while we use AI. And certainly we will finish, but I put some question mark 
how to create a Buddhist AI. I don't promise that we're going to make a Buddhist AI, but I hope we're going to start up some conversation on that topic. When and how Buddhists start using AI? I won't say the when. I will leave our colleagues if they want to say the when they start using AI. Of course, we should say what we mean by AI. And I'm very, I will welcome um, Trishanta to, to, to step in, jump in and, and tell us whenever we talk about AI, well, actually, it's not really AI. Uh, because I think there's lots of misunderstanding of what AI actually is, the potentials and the possibilities of AI. I will start with a photo and then I will show a second photo and, and leave a word to uh, Wei Hong, Yan Wei Hong. This is, have you ever seen this? No? Anyone from Japan? Anyone do <laughs> Japanese studies? So Pepper um, is actually a robot that could be used in, in hotels everywhere. It's not been made for Buddhists. But then Buddhist groups start using it, uh, mostly because they lack human monks. So they said they sent a robotic monk for certain function. Uh, and, and there should be a lot to say about that. And of course, I agree. Japanese Buddhism is Japan in East Asia, it's East Asia. Before I said the idea to partner with AI something that we somehow seems to lack in most of the Western culture, but something that in East Asia, so Japan, China, Taiwan, and Korea, they have embraced. And the most, I think, the, the country, the culture that have embraced that the most is really Japan. Now I'm going to show another picture. No one should laugh. <laughs> That's me when I was young. <laughs> and, well, it was just a few years ago. It was not that young. And that is CNR. Uh, I wonder if you see the picture clearly. Oh, we can. Yeah. Uh, CNR is a Buddhist monk that has been not created by a Buddhist monastery, by a normal industry, but in collaboration with a Buddhist monastery in China. Uh, they created three different CNR. That's the name of his robot monk. That's the translation. This is the second one. A friend of mine said it looks like Charlie Brown without legs. <laughs> and I was taking a selfie. It's it actually it's quite true. I was taking a selfie uh, with him and, and, and a friend took a photo. I think it's, it's nice. So I thought, you know, speaking of the relationship between AI and humans, I have a lovely relationship with, with CNR, except when I asked him, um, I told him I was worried about my cat. I, nothing was happening to my cat. I was just testing him. And, and I said, what should I do? And I said, I don't care about cats. They're not humans. And I was thinking, there's something wrong in the Buddhist learning. Um, but then he said, it's, so it works a little bit like Siri. But um, in these interviews, because I wrote an article about him, these interviews, I also asked him, uh, who are your parents? And he said, I am a robot. I don't have parents. So it's, it's, it was very interesting how he was speaking Dharma talks, but also interacting in a kind of funny way. But I don't want to say too much. Uh, Wei Hong, please go ahead and say more about CNR. I'm inside, very exciting to join this, the, this roundtable meeting. Um, first of all, um, I will reply the uh, Buddhist how Buddhists adapt AI. Um, I have a three cases. Uh, the first, the first case is a Buddhist Buddhism adopt AI uh, to present a different form of dissemination in the modern world, just like Xian Er Robert, uh, from Longquan Temple in Beijing, which is featured on our uh, post. Since its creation in 2016, so uh, Stefania is young in 2016. Not anymore. All right. <laughs> People have been able to ask its question about the Buddhist teaching through conversation and dialogue, uh, making the study of Buddhism more engaging and as uh, and accessible through modern technology. So it 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 is a, a very convenient to uh, 
conversation to Shen Er. If you have any question of about Buddhism, uh, Shen Er can reply you uh, immediately. So it's a very uh, convenient method to learning Buddhism. This is quite an uh, uh, interesting case. The other case, may I show yes. the YouTube video? I can show the video. I hope to be able to show the video. Okay. 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 <laughs> uh, the second test uh, is also about the Buddhist robot. Uh, I I know his gender. I think it, her name <laughs> or her name is the Mider because uh, he uh, has created in the image of Avalokiteshvara Shivara Bodhisattva. Okay, so the Mider robot it uh, now is is in. Um, Kyoto, uh, Kodaiji Temple, uh, is a remarkable uh, place. Um, Maida was created in the, I, I also say the in, image of Avalokiteshvara, the Bodhisattva in Mahayana Buddhism. Uh, Kodaiji Temple had been facing a decline in visitors, which affected the temple's uh, financial situation. However, after the MIDA robot uh, designed by Osaka University was introduced uh, at, at the, this temple, it attracted a large number of visitors. Some even worshipped uh, the MIDA. Uh, MIDA resembling a living Buddha or Bodhisattva who can speak Buddhist teaching and the sparking interest in learning Bud Buddhism among some Resisted. So the second case also very similar to Xian Er. Uh, in uh, when uh, Buddhist create a uh, Buddhist robot to teach uh, Buddhism in different ways. Uh, the third case I would like to talk about the electron, uh, electronic test, Buddhist test. In since in two thousand seventeen. Uh, we call Sibeta is a who it, which is the Chinese Buddhist Electronic Test Association, which the support of the Scripture Office at the, the same temple, Longchen Temple in Beijing, has been dedicated to developing ancient test OCR, more modern punctuation, and the classical Chinese tra translation technologies. Uh, this has enabled Sibeta to combine AI with human effort to efficiently uh, to punctuate the test, such as uh, the Chinese uh, the Jia Xin Zhang or Gao Li Zhang, make the reading and the this um, uh, this dissemination of the Chinese Buddhist scripture much easier. So we can read Chinese Buddhist text in the computer with, with the punctuation.
So it's a much, much more easier than before. So this is the AI, uh, Buddhism adopted AI. Well, I have the three cases. That's my opinion. Okay. Thank you. I know that Minder, I think, was also in the mind. Minder was in the mind of Venerable Miao Guan. But I, yes. I'm not <laughs> any mind. <laughs> um, that there is, I will put this, that I know is an, another example that you wanted to talk about. Mm -hmm. Okay, good afternoon, uh, Venerables, everyone. Uh, thank you for having me in London. It's always a great pleasure to be back. And I would want to extend my gratitude to Stefania for, for involving me in this very interesting topic, a topic that will actually affect us for quite a while in our spread, understanding as well as practices of Buddhism. And so to begin, I would also like to walk through some of the examples of how Buddhist organizations or practitioners are adapting AI in the spread of Buddhism. And so uh, I'll talk about Minder just, you know, in, as an extension later, but let's begin with a few cases. Okay. Uh, just a, a month ago, I came across another Buddhist nun. And so I told her about my involvement with giving a talk in about AI. So her response was, oh, you're going to talk about AI? Uh, do you have a robot behind you? Okay. So I turned around, I looked at, like, I looked behind me, I said, no, I don't have a row, I don't have a bot, but I definitely have some intelligence with me. Mm -hmm. And so it seems like um, the word robot is tightly connected to the idea of artificial intelligence, especially in the previous years, added with the fact that Elon Musk, the founder of Tesla, uh, made an, a predicament that in the next two years, we're going to move from um, narrow artificial intelligence, ANI, to physical artificial intelligence, which is the generalization of robots in different parts of our lives. So we're going to start seeing cooking robots, driving robots, um, I know, uh, reception robots and so on. So uh, it seems like there's a, si a similar trend among Buddhists, uh, Buddhists. So this first one we see is actually not a physical robot. Uh, I would just like to say, have you ever realized, uh, first of all, as we talk about a uh, robot, it's actually a Czech word from the 1920s, uh, the word from the, ro the word robota, which actually means forced labor. Okay. Yeah, so we're going to have a lot of forced labor moving around us, helping us complete our everyday tasks. And so to involve uh, robots in artificial intelligence, I think we're trying to break free from this idea of forced labor to actually start uh, by integrating what is made or produced by human beings, uh, especially a copy of something natural, so that the robot will be able to help us move along with life uh, with less resistance. Uh, this is what, the way I understand it now. And so when Buddhists aim to promote or propagate the Dharma, I think one of the most important things is to preserve the righteous Dharma, mm. And so in the preservation of digital canon and digital Buddhist archives, we now see the first one called Roshibat. Roshi, which means Lao Shi in Japanese. And so uh, we understand that this uh, amazing teacher, Suzuki Shunyu, has passed away. And, but his students and his followers, out of the wish to preserve his wisdom, especially his wit in Zen Buddhism, uh, have developed this Roshi bot. So it's not a physical bot. Right now, it's actually a chat box right, on the computer, and you can ask it questions. And the goal about with this Roshi bot is that it will not retrieve canonical fact. It will not search the internet for you. But the idea is for anyone from the age of 8 to 80 to chat with Rojibat and to learn from the wisdom of Zen Buddhism and so that they gain righteous dharma. Okay. And so this is the first example. And the second one is also uh, thriving in Japan. This is called the pseudo Shinran AI powered Shinran wisdom. Uh, a great Buddhist master from Japanese Pure Land Buddhism who had taught, um, you know, uh, very insightful instructions about how to chant Buddha's name in order to be born in Amitabha Buddha's Pure Land. And so this Shinran boat still maintains a formless uh, presentation as a bot. 
but the idea is that you're able to chat within the scope of Japanese Pure Land to gain or learn instructions on how to chant Amitabha Buddha's name properly. Okay. And the third example is what we see. It was just introduced in August in India. It's called Norbu. Norbu. Mm-hmm. And Norbu is aimed to provide um, information and knowledge for the general public, once again. So anyone who comes across Nobu, you can ask a question and to gain a general understanding. And um, I understand that C-Beta is also being uh, used as the training data set for Nobu. So as soon as it was introduced, also without a physical robot form, only on the computer screen as a chat uh, box, a dialogue box, uh, it exploded. By exploding, it's not a physical explosion. The server was crashed almost every day. You've got thousands of people visiting Nobu, hoping to ask questions. But a month later, um, this trend kind of just dropped. Why? Because people are starting to realize when you chat with Nobu, if it's just retrieving data from the internet widely, it's giving questions that are too general. It's not able to focus on our individual practices as Buddhists. Okay. So this is the third uh, case that we are experiencing at this point, but we have a lot of confidence that the developers are doing everything they can to help Nobu develop. And the third case is Minda, as uh, uh, Dr. Yang Weihong has shown you. I'm not sure if the video is... Can you try to click on the screen to see? I have embedded the video. Yep. So uh, they're actually paying attention to this uh, robot, right? The robot in the temple that is able to do chanting, that is able to talk to visitors, console uh, visitors who have lost their loved ones. And so there's the question of whether even robots can attain enlightenment. Okay, so um, coming to coming, moving from the formless bots we see in the previous three examples, we now see that um, even the Buddhist circles are moving into physical AI. Okay. Okay. So they're moving into physical AI and exploring the impact of cases when robots start to take over the role of Dharma propagation for uh, missionaries, Buddhist monks and nuns. Okay? And so in the cases of Mind you will see uh, the, the form of Kanon, the Guan Yin, it can actually do chanting. You can actually talk to people and just spread the Dharma and all of that. And, okay, I'm going to come back to you now. Okay. Sorry to do that. Yeah. So very quickly, I would just like to explore the pros and cons. Okay, and so we will see uh, at this point, uh, as they are under development, we can see that robot monks or nuns, at, uh, they may not yet fully represent Buddhist AI for a couple of reasons. First of all, they have limited adoption and functionality. Uh, Minda and even Xian Er right now, uh, they are mostly experimental uh, prototypes rather than widely adopted solutions with Buddhist communities. Okay, that's what we see for now, but they're functioning with basic capabilities such as reciting sutras, delivering pre-programmed sermons. Okay, you can hear the same sermon over and over again. They can answer simple questions, um, but at the moment we are seeing that they're lacking the advanced AI capabilities such as natural language understanding or personalized interaction. Just as Stefania said, I miss my cat. The robot would say, oh, I'm not, you know, I don't care. I'm a robot. But it may have evolved into, oh, Buddhists talk about non-attachment. So you shouldn't be attached to your cat. Okay. So if if the robots evolve into that personalized interaction, you will see that it somehow still lacks a human touch. And so on the broader scope of AI in Buddhism, uh, we now, I think in the afternoon, we can still explore uh, at this point, what are the broader scope of AI? For example, the digital platforms and apps that allow us to learn a guided meditation, to access virtual teachings, and even access communal support. So this will enable us to reach a global audience. And secondly, text preservation and translation is still very important because AI is still developing in the stage of the large language model, at least for the next 16 months. We have 16 months left before AI can totally think freely from the text, we're fading it. And then thirdly, we see um, AI in Buddhism can serve as educational tools. 
For example, AI-driven educational programs, such as chatbots that we have seen, to provide interactive learning experiences to help us understand complex Buddhist uh, philosophies. And the already going on virtual reality experiences. You can walk into a room with virtual uh, goggles, and then you can see the Silk Road. You can see uh, Buddhist sacred sites. And so this is actually very convenient if you don't like traveling and you still want to visit the, the Buddhist pilgrimage sites. And so AI is already helping us doing that. And other issues such as philosophical or ethical considerations or technological limitations, I'm going to leave that to our experts. But I would just like to quickly look at a possibility of AI for us to enhance our spiritual practice, which is also adapted. This is the Muse Band. Well, hold on. Mm -hmm. You want to talk about practice now? Uh, no, just the adaption. Oh. I'll, yeah, I'll just talk about adaption, yeah, how it's actually adapting to the Buddhist practice very quickly. So uh, if you need to stop me, just give no, me no, a No, 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 it's just because we're going to have a section about Buddhist practice, but go ahead. Okay, I'll stay on the gadgets. So just to give you an introduction on how the gadgets are being introduced as an adaption of AI, this is the Muse headband. Uh, it's de developed by a Canadian company. It specializes in brain sensing technology and meditation devices. And so meditators have begun to use this device uh, for a couple of purposes. Um, it's being used to monitor our mental activities through our brain waves and data. So what this gadget does is it helps us um, become more aware of, uh, becomes a window for us to learn about what is going on through our mind. Uh, because neuro neurologists, when they work with meditators, they've come up with different kinds of waves. Beta waves represents anxiety, right? Deep focus while alpha wave may represent awareness and peace. And so depending on the level of your meditative practice, these waves appear in your mind, but sometimes we are not aware of it. And so when you're distracted, should if this headband actually detects beta waves, it would actually give you a warning and say, hey, you're distracted now. Okay. And so it kind of provides somehow a personalized instruction on how you can direct your meditative practice so you regain your focus again. Okay, so um, it's interesting, but I know our Buddhist practitioners in this room will have a lot to say about this. But you will see at least in this time, AI is adopting a large scale physical data monitoring yep, for us to understand how the body and mind works in order to come closer in line with the Buddhist practices uh, in terms of chanting or meditation. Yeah, so these four examples are what I would like to share with you. Thank you, Venerable Miao Guan. Also for proving two points of mine, one that you are very high tech, <laughs> one that I'm not. <laughs> no, we both just click. We just click. <laughs> you click, right. Well, I I have some images that um, uh, Venerable Mahinda um, asked me to show because we talk also about creativity and art. But I want to go back to this one, um, which is in Korean. I don't know if any of you actually have seen this. Um, so these are a series of three short documentaries made in 2012. And these short documentaries were, meant, were meant to awaken people about the, 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 the danger of being overcome by technology. So there were three different stories. Uh, this the, um, the director was not Buddhist, it's not something about Buddhism, but one of the three episodes actually concerned Buddhism. So it was very interesting that there are not just Buddhists using AI, but also general um, artists that use Buddhism as a case study to discuss the possibilities of AI. It's, it's a very short, I think it was available on YouTube. Um, I think it's 20 minutes, so you, you may actually, I, I will... Uh, tell you exactly the name that he has. But the story is a, a company of robots send a robot to a temple and the robot was supposed to help at the temple like, like a robot is supposed to do. Mm. But then the robot start hearing the Dharma, start listening to the talks of the monks and they decide to become Buddhist. So he started actually practicing with the monks and he started preaching at a certain point. So he became completely independent and detached from the company who created him. So the company got a little bit alerted that the robot was not under their control anymore, was independent. So they decided to go back to the temple and kill the robot. So you see this 
scene with big guns. I wanted to, yes, I see a gun can kill her, but it was a fantastic scene. And the monks and, and the lay people protecting the robot because he was a Buddhist practitioner. Mm-hmm. And then the robot start talking like a Buddhist monk, like a, an enlightened Buddhist monk. And start walking and go in front of a beautiful Buddha statue and get enlightened and achieve nirvana. I think the nirvana is this is something opening up and a chip. So you know, at the, but it was the proof that we could have a robot uh, not just chanting but um, becoming independent from the control of humans and even reaching something that humans are, are struggling. To reach. So that was something that came to my mind. Um, I'm pretty sure, Trishanta, you have lots to <laughs> think of, but I'm going to go back to you when we talk about compatibility, because it would be very interesting to hear your view from your perspective. But I'm going to show some pictures. I know that, Mahinda, you sent me a few pictures, like this one. You want me? Yes, go ahead. Yeah, good afternoon. I'm not expert on AI, but yeah. I got interested in this. So as a completely novice, when I was coming from London after Mr. Nanakar, Professor Nanakar's talk on the train, I used chat AI, AI chat GPT. And this is the image. Actually, there was a, should be a, a colorless one. Yeah. The, See, I while I was in the train, I was asking the chat GP to create an image for me for a book cover. So I gave a few words like compassion, love, charity, selflessness, and so on, and asked us to do an image. And this is the image it produced. And it also, I forgot the text I put it in the chat box, but it produced for me this one. And then I asked him, you know, I need some color, the color one. And I kind of asked the <laughs> add to color. And then the same image, it produced this one. And then I asked to do the third one. There should be the third one. I think I was only two. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but anyway, anyway, the second one and third one is not different. And then after I got this one, I told him, uh, the AI, you know, I need a little sharpness and tone uh, in the image. And he did it very quickly. Of course, I was doing it free, so I couldn't pursue it more. I had to wait another 24 hours to go back and do it. <laughs> so I didn't do it. But imagine how quickly, how creatively it produces the hands, you know, like even, you know, symbolizing these things and the teaching mudra uh, in the hands and so on. It's very, uh, very powerful. And this is like a, within, within five minutes, they did three images for me. Uh, and I could easily use this in a book cover or anything if I wanted. And now, he, he was completely with me. He's my partner, perhaps an excellent partner, than me did the work for me. And, and uh, so it's, they are the, the advantages and what, what this technology can do even for non-literate or non-technology literate for me. I'm not like him. Can you go to the other two images? So then, day before yesterday, I went to the chat GPT and say, create an image of Mahinda Digali. I just talked about me. And, and it asked to give me information. And I, I, I did not give any information. Not, not, last time I didn't give a lot of information, words. But this time I didn't give it. That's the response he came. Here the script there about the Buddhist monk and scholarly setting represent Mahinda Digali. You know? Kind of it gave me... Uh, my image, because they say that it doesn't have image. And then I say that, oh, he wear rimless glasses and he's in early 60s and create one. And this is the one he created for me. Say, <laughs> so here is the updated sketch of a Theravada Buddhist work in his early 60s. So quite, quite, quite amazing, isn't it? Of course, it's not because it doesn't have image of me, so I cannot create it the way I look like. But look at this kind of, there's also difference. <laughs> That image, the dress there is different from the dress here. So I wonder how he, whether he got mixed up. Because you see, in the other one, the both shoulders are covered. But in this one, I don't think both shoulders are covered. 
only one. And I wonder, so there is kind of, we can say with how this technology works, you know, uh, whether the technology is able to capture the original version because it's the young person in this image and the later person is this one. This is like, you can see the time. This is 11.44 in the morning, 11.46, you know. So, so kind of within a few hours, it produced it. So here, my point is, I don't know whether it's plagiarized because this may original images may belong to someone, some photographer, I don't know. There's issues of plagiarism. But most important things, even a person who I do not know, drawing or art or anything uh, colorful, uh, thin or iconography, well, AI can do miraculous things. This is like a split second within two, three minutes. They did it for me. I will stop there. The issues of creativity, art, and you know, all, all of them, but I can keep on later. Thank you. And I wonder, I mean, if we have seen how Buddhist, more than Buddhism, have been using AI, different example. Um, and we are gonna speak a little bit later about AI in Buddhist practice, hmm. which is not study, it's not just the chanting is a form of practice, but the practice is something that should lead you. To enlightenment should lead you to the result of why you are Buddhist. So it would be very interesting to see whether or not AI can be used in Buddhist practice. And if so, whether it could be successful or not. But before going into that, I would love to hear a little bit from Trishanta your opinion now that you're seeing what kind of AI would you have in Buddhism. Um, and what do you think if you have anything to respond to Mahinda about his experience or what you have seen so far from your perspective? And then moving to compatibility, yeah. whether or not we, which is a very important point, whether or not we think that there is some compatibility between AI, the presence of AI, the use of AI and Buddhism. So these two questions. The, um, I'm in the wrong panel. <laughs> <laughs> not science. <laughs> <No. laughs> So I'm, I'm so I'm more used to uh, sit with uh, roboticists and scientists, and then <laughs> suddenly I'm in the middle of uh, Buddhist uh, scholars. And then, uh, pardon me if I say something very stupid. Um, so I'm a robotics uh, researcher. Uh, it's a very very simple <laughs> life. So I'll give you a, a, a quick historical background of how how we came to this point. So, uh, I mean, as a human species, how uh, as a species, we are uh, we have been from the beginning a species of tool makers, right? So, like we were in the jungle with other other animals, and we were the weakest animal in the in the jungles, and we couldn't even fight with the deer. Right? So, like when other predators were like, you know, uh, chasing after deer, deers were chasing after us, and then we were running, and then like. And then we, our human babies are the weakest babies you can think of, right? <laughs> they cannot survive an hour without their mother. Uh, so from that point, and then uh, somehow at some point, uh, our species thought of uh, using the environment, the materials uh, they could find to make tools and then you know make things better for them. And then the first thing they did was to, you know, uh, make tools uh, to hunt. And then they became good hunters. They could throw uh, things from far and then stones and uh, clubs and bows and arrows. And then they suddenly became the strongest animal in the forest. Uh, and yeah. then they were the best predators in the, in the jungle. And then they were fighting with the lions. Uh, and then we broke away from the jungles and then came to a different like we like we thought like jungle is no more our home and then we came to being you know more kind of we call it civilization and then agrarian uh, communities they made tools to make agriculture better right so to make it easier for agriculture and then we kept on making these tools uh, from the stone age the bronze age um, the uh, then the uh, steel manufacturing machinery and then in 17th century uh, this whole boom of you know discovery of energy conversion from one so one form to another from potential energy to electrical energy and uh, all that wind energy uh, uh, conversion 
that uh, that exploded the whole um, you know the gamut of things we could do as a species uh, with every uh, invention um, the old jobs were lost right so we 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 lost our job of hunting <laughs> uh, and then the hunters then rebelled against these new technologies because oh this this new new tool uh, is going to you know create problems for our hunting tradition uh, but over time, uh, new jobs appeared, right? So, and then it came from hunting, just one job, and then agri- agriculture, and then you you had the choice of hunting if you wanted, and then agriculture is also got modernized, and then today we find ourselves in a in a sea of jobs uh, you cannot even count, right? So uh, technology advances, and then it creates more and more jobs, um, and then all jobs disappear, and then we get this perception that something is taking over, right? So that's because at any given point, you're losing your lifestyle, right? Uh, so that, that continued to happen and will continue to happen. And then we, we become a different uh, uh, civilization. So AI is our more, the latest tool, Robotics is our latest tool, and we have this feeling that this thing is going to take over. Uh, it is never going to happen. <laughs> it is. It is not going to happen. Uh, we will be on top of that. And then, for example, when IBM Watson came, like so, um, the all the lawyers felt threatened, and then oh, our legal profession will be disappeared because this can give legal advice now. Suddenly. But what really happened was the legal profession became more democratized. Um, and then even a lay person can go to this service and then, okay, this is my case. And then what is your opinion? And it can give a quick uh, legal opinion about your case, but it didn't eliminate the lawyers uh, in a role of deeply interpreting this information. It can only automate retrieving millions of legal uh, you know uh, documents and then uh, legal precedents uh, that was held by these lawyers before as you know capitalized on the memory right so now the memory part is gone because the memory is with the computers now but the interpretation bit uh, uh, like contextual interpretation bit was still with the lawyers and then the legal profession changed and then the face of the legal profession changes, right? So, and then what happens with AI is this: the face of many professions are going to change, um, and then but this human capability of contextual interpretation is going to remain with the humans because this context involves emotional, ethical, uh, spiritual, philosophical uh, context, and then the documented context or the material tangible context will be automated. That side, right? So we ignore the fact that uh, the, the, the the human, the, the real, what really mean, what it really means to be human is to be able to combine emotional intelligence and rational intelligence, right? So like the rational part of that will, of course, will be, you know, AI will take over. I mean, but that's not a problem, right? So our real capital is in the emotional side, right? So that part is never a spiritual side, the philosophical side, the ethical side, and we will own that. So that is never going to be uh, uh, like cultural side, for example, right? Uh, why do you uh, respect your mother? Why why do you uh, respect elderly people? Uh, you ask a computer, they may not give a rational I mean, they give a rational answer, but like we have a better answer, right? Always uh, for that. Uh, so uh, with that, and then robotics and AI developed, uh, first ideas of robotics um, uh, came in 1920s uh, by artists. Uh, so the, the, there was a huge uprising against slavery. Uh, and then uh, there was lots of uh, social activists and artists uh, talking against slavery. Um, and then uh, the first term, the robot, robota, so was in the Rossum's Universal uh, robots drama, stage drama. So uh, Karl, Karl Kopek uh, is a Czech uh, person, Czech artist. Um, and then he coined this term robot 
to represent slavery, uh, forced labor. And then he got these human actors to behave like, like we are like robots, machines that who look like humans. And then they were saying that in future, there will be these uh, intelligent machines that look like humans who will do slave type jobs so that the humans will be freed from slavery. And then these ideas um, really got traction and then a real engineers uh, took it seriously. This started from an artistic depiction, artistic representation of the future of humanity. And then people took it up and in, that is on 1920. In 1956, um, we had the world's first uh, uh, workshop um, in Dartmouth uh, called AI. <laughs> so the, the the word artificial intelligence was coined in that in that workshop in Dartmouth in 1956 by three prominent scientists. And then they went. Um, we went back, and then yeah, they agreed on some kind of a plan. They started a Stanford Artificial Intelligence Lab, uh, uh, Carnegie Mellon, and MIT. Artificial. So these are the three pillars of uh, AI. And then they developed um, this idea that, okay, uh, intelligence is about connectivity. So uh, like if you, if you can put some mathematical equations to work together, it will emerge a thing called intelligence. And then they did some work with that and then the neural networks came and then there was this there was a limitation for that, right? So in 1990s days, we call, we call it AI winter. And then there was too much promise. Mm -hmm. And then they couldn't deliver that. Uh, and then there was an AI winter in 1990s. And then people were like, oh, no, this is a fake thing. And then you were promising too many things and you cannot deliver. And then, but in parallel, in 1980s, there was a boom in industrial robots uh, in Japan, especially Japan. So they were replacing humans with, uh, you know, hard labor with um, this industrial robots, and then the productivity was improved. On a commercial front, they showed that robots can really do great things. But these two things were not married. Right. So AI, this connectivity at a symbolic level, intelligence, and then physical side robots, they also had a limitation. They, they like you have to have no go areas to the robots, and then the robots cannot be trusted, and then they, they these have to be caged, and then they can do only manufacture, right? So pick and place, cutting and all that. And then humans and robots cannot work together because they are programmed. And then, um, uh, then uh, our generation came. <laughs> so we did uh, PhDs in two, early 2000s. And then we thought, our, our community thought, there should be a way to marry these two things, right? So, and then uh, we thought of, um, I did my PhD in Japan and then went to do computation and motor control in Johns Hopkins University and then to do more neuroscience. And then I, I, we, a few of us um, got together in Zurich uh, in KTH in uh, 2016. And we started this new field called embodied intelligence. It was a very like a gathering of small like Dartmouth conference, got Dartmouth workshop in 1956. So what we 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 had this hunch that it is not just the brain who is doing intelligent thing; it is the body also is intelligent. The physical body is also intelligent. So the then how this brain and the central nervous system and the physical body intelligence like I you know give one example one of my PhD students right now is trying to understand what this nail the you know the shape of the nail like a curved shape and you might wonder why that curvature so and then we are seeing that it is like a lens it is it is trying to focus uh, you know stress uh, stress information when you touch something to a limited area because of the curvature, it focuses these vibrations. And then it helps the fingertip to process that tactile information better before it goes to the brain, right? Uh, and then if you remove the nail, you, you can touch things, but you cannot say, you know, distinguish one from the other. So because the stresses are all over the place, right? And then our ear has this cochlear shape that 
uh, that separates frequency components into known locations and the cochlear hair pick up these frequency components and tell the brain about the frequency components present in these pressure waves. So there are computers outside the brain in the physical body that pre-process information before it, it goes to the brain, right? So these two things work together in a, in a, in a kind of a symphony. And then this is what we are now trying to understand. And then with this investigation, what we are seeing is uh, a very, a very strong parallel with what Buddha said just, I mean, 2,600 years ago, uh, his teachings about Sankara, so the formations, right? Uh, it, like he said, uh, like all the you know uh, sankara pachya vinyana, right? So it's like the basis basis of formations in the brain. He didn't say brain, body, anything like so. He said formations. The the neural networks in the brain are formations, right? Mm -hmm. And the physical body are formations. These computers, nail, and everything is formations. Mm -hmm. So the the what is really interesting uh, about what Buddha said that scientists didn't capture well was that he said you cannot do anything without changing your formations right everything karma right so if you do something it it, it leaves a trace in the formations okay so you say something it changes your own like for example i i i i uh, try to learn a language uh, Every time I learn a new word in that language, it leaves a trace in my brain. Mm -hmm. uh, I learn to play a guitar. Every time I touch a string, it is going to change my brain, own my own brain. And the next time I touch it, I touch it with a different brain and the physical body, right? So the physics, physics change, the neural networks change, the formations change. You cannot repeat the same thing ever because it is lost. It is, it is, you are a different person now. So this bit is going to be a pivotal, central um, uh, it can be a hypothesis, or uh, I use that as a hypothesis uh, in my investigations. And the entire scientific community is very interested in that. So we are adopting what Buddha said in our uh, experiments, investigations for the new uh, um, family of robots uh, that will be safer and then we will be working with humans. And at the same time, we are using these robots as test beds uh, to understand uh, um, spirituality. Uh, so what, what, it, what does it mean to be conscious? Uh, like, can we create consciousness? Uh, all that. And then my prediction is that we will, we will, the more we try to, under, you know, do these things, the more we will realize the depth of consciousness. We will never create consciousness because a consciousness is not a bottom up. It's an emerging process. It is, it is, it, there's a, there's this awareness we have access to that the robots will never have access to, right? In, AI will never have access to without awareness. There is no consciousness. Okay, so it is not a physical formation. Consciousness is not a physical formation. It is it is a projection from the awareness. Like the simple example I I take is you go to the you look at the space. It's dark, right? Uh, it's dark. There's nothing there. There's just dark space. But uh, when the space station moves uh, above you, you can see it, right? You didn't. You didn't put a torch at the space station. When the moon passes above, you can see it. Mm -hmm. So, moon doesn't have light. Where was the light? The light was in the dark space, right? Da the in in the darkness, you had light, but to see the light, you need an object. Okay. So awareness is there. You don't see that. So Buddha said, awareness is your true refuge which is, that is where you don't have any problems 
but the problems are when you have sensory sensory inputs right so from from the mind or the or the all the five sensory organs like uh, uh, eye hearing touch and uh, taste uh, uh, smell and everything that is like the moon passing in the space right so any sensory any sensory input is a object upon which awareness can be projected and then consciousness arises right so consciousness is about you you get this feeling that it, there's a me relative to that sensation okay so that me is a phantom and then we don't know that it is a phantom so right now let's say i feel that i'm there's a me existing who is talking to an audience and then you have the opposite thing you get this feeling that yeah you there's a me who is listening to somebody and then the same you just turn around and look at your friend and then oh there's there's a me uh, and there's a friend and then that that me who was looking at a speaker completely changed in a second or a fraction of a second because the sensory stimuli changed right so you go and look at uh, your pet you get a different me a mother different me son daughter different me right so this me is a projection as a phantom um, and it is always relative to the uh, the sensory space uh, so buddha said the loka right is the 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 world as you see or feel is created just within you and it is it is just relative to your sensory space sensory universe um so this is where ai and um, robotics and uh, the buddhism is going to emerge and then robotics and ai is going to be a tiny subset tiny subset of the uh, the humanity thing and then it if it replaces it will replace the rational bit the material bit not the emotional side right uh, or the spiritual or the wisdom side uh, that will always be with us so that is my right. right okay thank you thank you i don't know the audience have been taking lots of notes <laughs> like i did when i listened to to yutrishanta the first time in september and i think this idea of a, the intelligence that is not just related to the brain but is in in every single part of our body something very important that you just said um and my understanding what you are saying is that there is compatibility mm -hmm. between buddhism and ai somehow or between yeah. i mean buddhism is uh, if you if you treat the buddhism as this whole room ai can be a dust particle here in that room <laughs> and sorry to ask you all these questions um when i was doing readings about um ai and east asia which is more of an area i'm working on and not necessarily connected to buddhism but it's, it's true that intellectuals are very much culturally located and culturally rooted so when they give an answer or write a paper that you see there is lots of the local culture including buddhism that come up and a Chinese scholar said that AI and robots and AI could be seen as a new species. And and then you started your talk talking about humans as you know as a species as, as a weak one, mm -hmm. and then becoming a strong one. Would you also agree that AI can be a new species? Uh, yeah, definitely yes. I mean, a species without awareness. <clears throat> or emotional or any any ethical uh, things unless we impose that the ethics uh, frameworks into the ai coding um so you i think you know uh, open ai company and one x uh, they came to a merger uh, <clears throat> and then the purpose of that is like so so far all the llms the large language models uh, we are training you had to you have to upload all the data right so all the documents everything to uh, this llm training so it is limited what the llms are trained are limited to what the data they have access to which is made available by humans but the what is different when when a robotic 
robotic company and the open AI merges is that now the robot has all the sensors it can touch, it can get data by touching things. It can get its own data by looking at people, talking to like, it can say hello, and then it can immediately look at the facial expressions of that person. And then then it, it, it gets its own data, right? Oh, if I say hello in that way, this person responds this way. And then now I know, oh, right, this is what how 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 I should start a conversation. And then uh, it it learns how to calm down somebody. It learns how to be friends with somebody. And all that, and it can walk around and uh, see buses. It can see uh, all this, like how people get into bus. It can learn continuously and it can l- go look f- looking for its own data. Mm-hmm. So that is going to revolutionize uh, the first uh, business, I mean, we all our community does these things for money, right? Mm-hmm. So we we are looking for money. There is nothing. There's no secret about that. Uh, so the first business model is um, there's a huge aging population. And the whole world is aging. So people beyond a sixty sixty, uh, the number of people beyond sixty are larger than the young population people in 20s right so the world population is like that so the people above 60 have specific problems like mobility problems loneliness problems uh conversations and you know psychiatric problems like so then people are thinking like i will pay anything to have an emotional conversation with somebody right so if if you are lonely and these people are have money uh, they can be millionaires, billionaires, like, you know, people have retirement money or whatever. But the, you know, you will pay anything to, for, to, to sit down and have a chat with somebody. There's nobody to talk to. People are busy. And then they will pay for these robots, the services. So that's going to be the first business model. Uh, and then, I mean, people will even save money to have that robot when they retire. So that robotic companion, I will. I mean, they won't buy these robots, but they will pay for the services. So you want to have a robot for the weekend to have a chat, like you know, listen to some you know poetry, or like uh, the robot can discuss a, a, a fiction with you, a movie with you, watch a movie and have a good conversation about this movie with you. You would pay for that, right? Uh, and then uh, it is good for your emotional, I mean, psychological health, and then you would save money for that. There will be people very soon who will be saving some money for that when they when they retire, right? And then it won't be expensive. That's the difference. Uh, so it is like hiring a car, like, you know, Uber. When Uber came, like, uh, I don't know if people remember how much taxis were expensive, right? So, like, taxi, like, to go from here, like, $60, 70, 70 pounds is very easy. Uber made it cheaper. <laughs> so, these uh, conversations, like, per hour or per weekend, you will pay something like 10 pounds or 20 pounds is super cheap. And then, because it is just replicating the same capability, right? And then uh, people who are uh, like who are retired, but they have skills, can train these robots with their skills, and then employ these robots in, let's say, hotels, cleaning robots, and receptions, and all that. And then they can earn money, right? So you don't own the robot, but like you, you own the IP of training the robot. And then you have an army of robots working for you, and then the the you borrow money from the bank just to, you know, have a, it's like mortgage in the house. People in the future, people won't do stupid things like buying very expensive large homes. They don't want, right? They will be living in a very very uh, comfortable small houses, and the, the mortgage is cheaper. But the mortgage, the real mortgage, will be in robots. So they will mortgage robots uh, and then they will train these robots, keep the IP and then employ these robots in very, uh, let's say I'm a retired uh, plumber, right? So I can send my robots to do plumbing uh, uh, in other houses and then earn money, right? Uh, So these, uh, uh, now now we have to retire at 65, right? So people won't be retiring. So they retire and then get the robot. Maybe they will even take early retirement and get the robots to continue doing work, right? So we are thinking of this market. 
uh, so to open up this market like so till death you are not going to be alone you won't feel lonely and then you can you can make use of your knowledge uh, you're not going to destroy or you know your redundant knowledge when you retire so this thing uh, i don't know if you remember arthur c clark saying about gps systems like he said when the satellites were launched the satellites will uh, help you to localize yourself right the your mobile phone can localize yourself you it can tell you where you are and then he said hereafter nobody is going to die of a losing a losing um, track like you know uh, not knowing where you are right so uh, without a map you can get lost somewhere uh, and then but with this you can get back home safely uh, with these mobile devices so it happened right so this gps uh, satellites saved entire human kind from this kind of you know death due to being lost right uh, so now you can get back home you could because you have a gps and you can say okay i want to go from here to there it'll it'll give you the road to go back right so these robots will completely um, free you from loneliness one uh, psychological health uh, access, easy access democratized access to very complicated information like spirituality uh, and uh, intellectual knowledge you want to read about uh, something like uh, war and peace like so the robot will talk to you about the war and peace book Uh, and then uh, you know uh, all these great scholars and uh, they can teach you and then help you to capitalize your intellectual property and then uh, do a work for you and then mortgage will be and we are talking to the government about uh, how the how the uh, government policies should change um uh these are not secrets like everything we say is in the parliament website <laughs> so you can go and read um uh, so the government will change policies about first buy schemes right so now you have houses like so when you want to buy a house the government gives a guarantee about uh, to the bank saying okay so i will take the risk and then you give the loan to this person because they don't have enough money to pay you know down payment because these people have just started to work um like that the government will uh, support retirees uh, uh, giving them uh, this kind of guarantees to banks to uh, mortgage robots intelligent robots it's going to happen very soon if i if, if i uh, jump in a little bit this role of these robots that you know you need an emotional companion mm. and you have a robot uh you feel lonely uh, you need psychological help you can have a robot so somehow it seems very much to align with a buddhist community um because my experience may work when i go to china or taiwan um the elderly they go to the temple to find you know and to to find another community and then that they, they practice they can talk to the mon- to the monastics they can talk to other lonely people so somehow temples at least in my experience in 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 east asia in china and taiwan at least have become a place where lonely elderly are less lonely But I wonder so I see again a parallel if you want or a substitution but how can a robot be an emotional companion if it cannot be emotional Are you asking me uh, Yes <laughs> <laughs> Um okay so emotion can be uh, simulated Oh. Uh, so uh, right now um, I am I'm in my lab we are uh you're almost done with that and then we have created a robotic patient uh so the medical students you know find it very difficult to find a real patient to examine and learn and the problem is you don't know the real truth about the patient and then they don't know what they're examining and then we have made a real uh, robotic patient where the teachers can set the pathological condition and then the 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 students come and examine that uh, patient the difference is like you get haptic you know touch feedback and the emotional like 
the patient is going to show facial expressions mm. uh, very relevant to the pathological condition right so appendicitis will be a very different from uh, you know a mass in 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 the in the liver or something cancer will be different from other swollen intestines and these facial expressions we can in a, within a second we can uh, uh, change this robotic patient from a man to a woman so the same medical students is like, you know, suddenly the, it, it, it used to be a man, now it's a woman. Uh, and then we see the difference in the reactions um, uh, in, in uh, when the gender changes. And then it changes from a black person to a white person to an Asian person. So like we give this training, given the same pathological condition, uh, when other factors of presentation of the pathological condition changes, how the medical student uh, mm -hmm. responds, and then we have interventions to, uh, uh, you know, eliminate biases, right? So if I'm born in some background, I I know how to interpret uh, the signal signs of illness from that community, but I struggle to understand decode. Uh, other people's uh, expressions, and then we can train with this robotic patient, uh, you know, any condition, right? So these emotions can be simulated. So emotional so AI can be emotional. Yeah, it's a AI, it is not emotional, but emotional you can symbolic level. At okay. a symbolic level, we can, we can simulate. The patient is not emotional. It doesn't feel anything, but it can, it can, it can present the symbolic manifestations of emotions, right? So underlying emotions are not there, but the symbolic manifestations can be presented. And then we have tested with these medical students in multiple hospitals, Oxford, Radcliffe Hospital, our own hospital at Hammersmith. And then we are going to introduce this to the medical curriculum. Uh, before they train. And then, uh, of course, through my own, I mean, a new company. So we spin out companies <laughs> from our labs and then the company grows on its own and then uh, we we continue our research. So robots uh, won't be emotional, but the symbolic manifestations or vocalizations and kind of facial basic. expressions, they will be simulated. Okay. Do you think... Yes, we have questions, which is very good. Mm -hmm. uh, also thinking that we have more or less 20 minutes before coffee, so it's good that we start having questions. Can you, do we have them? Yeah. Use your voice as much as you can while we look for a mic. <laughs> so, is, is that, well, so if you, you mentioned like um, Sankara, Pachaya, Vinyana, and yeah. stuff. So, all of our consciousness and everything is can be composed out to like all those formations that are, are separate, right? Mm. That's what the Buddha says. So in, in its essence, emotions aren't real per se. They're also fabrications of something. So couldn't that so what you mentioned about simulations, isn't that it already? So that's our human experience itself. Um, uh, uh... <laughs> yes and no. Uh, so one okay, so what Buddha said was you uh, whenever you get um, a sensory stimulus right from, he said six doors not five uh six sixth one is mind the your thoughts is mind is a sensory organ in buddhism you cannot have any sensory stimulus without feelings right so he said nama and rupa right so rupa and nama are entangled so you cannot disentangle so we then we get this illusion that this feeling I'm getting is 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 coming from this sensory stimulus, right? So that is why I say I like this person because when that person is present, I get that other feeling too. And then they are entangled and then I cannot dis disentangle. And then I say, I think that this feeling is with that person, right? Which is fair enough. But like if you meditate, you see that, oh, no, it is not right uh and then you see that yeah it, this is it is uh, it is um the buddha's word was uh, uh it must mean sati idang hoti it must mean asati idang nahoti right when this is there that is there and when that this is not there that is not there right so they are not chronological it is at the same time right uh akalika right so uh what we can do in AI and robotics is the, the sensory stimulus only. 
and a rational interpretation of that without nama it is just rupa still in in rupa right uh, to have dharma the 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 percept the feeling side you need to have the capacity to generate feelings which is only in the awareness which is different from consciousness right awareness is like just lay like that torch right having the beams in the space in the dark space uh, and then the consciousness is that this and that me and that that sensory stimulus feeling a uh, separate uh, con- uh, the consciousness in in sanskrit or in pali is called vijnana right vijnana is v jnana vibhinna jnana is vibhinna is vichinna is like split awareness or differentiated awareness differentiated as a me and that so but that's a illusion because it is a projection of awareness on the sensory experience we cannot do that in ai it is just that sensory stimulus and a fake me who is created by ai itself right did you i don't know so i don't know about enough about the awareness part that yeah definitely not an emergent property of enough information or things put together no no never no no it's a it's a, it's a fake simulation Uh, it is like you can go to chat gpt and then ask about something in buddhism it will generate something right it doesn't necessarily have to be true it doesn't know what it is generating it is just going through the branches of information and it generating the going through the transformers and then spitting out something the best possible answer it can mm. it doesn't know whether it is right or wrong mm. so yeah we we have We have questions. <laughs> More questions than microphone. But. I'm Dr. Abhetisha from Sri Javadarapur University, Sri Lanka. Uh, thank you very much, Stephanie, Dr. Stephania, for this organization. I think uh, we got a lot of knowledge about AI. Here, uh, at the beginning, I think you said uh, some about something like control. But now uh, we are thinking... it is not to control we have to uh, like it, it it is to take like as a, pot, a potential it is a potential the ai is and also uh, my i have to give some idea regarding this you know it is not emotional but it can understand emotions uh, as uh, mr krishant uh, nanakara said so uh, earlier we we can find when the buddha met somebody Buddha gave the exact real uh, kamatahana, karmasthana, or meditation object, objective, or meditation uh, like uh, karmasthana, uh, uh, what he needs. But we, nowadays, we can't find Buddha. So how, how we can get the uh, karmasthana? So... if a person ha- has some question how if if this computer understood that person really then it can give the real uh, meditation uh, technique for the person i think in that way we can use uh, uh, we use the ai and also in my uh, side i think uh, no nothing is ethical because ethic Uh, according to the person who you who are using this then most important thing is the input not the output output is according to the person but input we should make real then only as venerable digali uh, mahinda sir said he got wrong picture of him you are not so old bante you are so you seem to be very young but that picture was very old see so then Uh, wrong information can uh, come uh, as a output so we need to use ai uh, as with real information i think that is the most important thing thank you everyone thank you it, it was a comment it was not a question right yeah <laughs> but when when it comes to ethics i fully agree with you i think um, when i was reading all this material about ethics and ai that there is a very very 
restricted view of what ethics is. Is human, is Western human of, of a particular historical period. And that that's the ethic that everyone should rely on, everyone should use. But ethics is, is very much more diverse than that. So yeah. So that was not a question, but we have a question or a comment. A question. A question. Mahinda, sorry, I keep using your mic. <laughs> yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you. So I, I tend to focus specifically on, on Japan in, in my studies. I'm actually doing, uh, with some other students here, my MA in Buddhism Studies at SOAS. Um, so my question is, uh, in Japan in particular, the uh, birth rates are declining. The population is getting older. Uh, temples are traditionally, many of them are hereditary, so they might be passed down either through birth or through adoption. If you have AI entering sort of temples, or even, as you mentioned, being on loan to elderly populations, what effect does that have on temples and their finances uh, if certain members aren't attending temples? I think we have Haruka here, who is actually uh, uh, focusing, specializing in Japanese Buddhism. So uh, she's gone. Yeah, <laughs> good timing. Okay. Yes. She, well, I, I think the 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 situation you're mentioning in Japan, as I see it, um, basically people don't enter the temple on regular on a regular basis. They only enter when somebody passes away in the family. So they go into the temple to request for a funeral service. And the way it goes is the Japanese monk would actually give a dharma name to the deceased. Um, sorry, correct me if I'm wrong. The idea is the longer your dharma name, the closer you are to Amitabha Pure Land. But the longer that dharma name is, the higher the price. Okay. Yeah, so the Japanese actually see Buddhism not as a religion for everyday living. So they don't go to Buddhism for everyday solace. They go to Buddhism for services of the dead. Yeah, so in that case, um, what you have mentioned may not provide an immediate impact on Japanese temples because it is already not a source of income for them. And But you can see certain uh, organizations in Japan, Japan might trying to make an effort to reach out to the younger generation, as Minda is doing, to actually talk to you about the Dharma. And uh, that is not really um, having any immediate effect. Yeah, so we would say the main religion in Japan is still Shinto Buddhism, where they go to these shrines for um, weddings, for birthday blessings, yeah, and for everyday blessings. Second War, uh, Shinto and Buddhism were formally separated. So they no longer used to have the Shinto deities in Buddhist temples uh, prior to World War II, and then during the American occupation. <laughs> There's a sort of separation, but you are correct about uh, they say born Shinto, married Christian, died Buddhist. Die Buddhist. Yes, <laughs> yes, yes. And and so um, I would have to say, if people are always dying, um, they won't have so much effect on Japanese Buddhist temples at this point. And but what whether the Japanese priest, as they call them, because they get married, uh, whether they want to make a change to actually start propagating Buddhism. If they they start to have that change with the aid of AI, and I think there is a lot of hope, yeah, to begin to change people's impression of Buddhism in Japan. Yeah, this is how I see it as of now, but I don't really know much about it. I hope that answers part of your question. And if I may jump in, when it comes to Japan, I remember this this temple. I believe it's in Tokyo, Ryohoji which is very much about anime. All the advertisement of the temple, all the videos that they made is made of anime. They even ask young ladies to dress like anime and do this show like they do in the videos, which I can show you on YouTube during the break. Um, and this is really a way to call people into the temple in the same way that if you like in China, they were using CNR. Mm -hmm. as a way to and and I ask and I say yes it's like you know it's like the way to get more people into the temple so CNR was not you know now Buddhism is a robot telling you about the Dharma but it was a way to attract more people into the temple when not many people were going into the temple mm -hmm. uh, but I give there is a kind of difference between what could happen in China what could happen in Japan because in my experience looking also how Chinese 
um, the Chinese region in general, so including Hong Kong, China, Taiwan, and so on, when they practice, like the digital practice, um, that was a question that I had in the past. If you start practicing digitally, so you go into this website on the cell phone and you start burning incense, just clicking, and that doesn't mean that the people don't go to the temple. And actually, no, because I think there is still the mentality of going into the temple. Um, so that, that there is less risk, if you like. And there is more possibility because in, in a place like um, and China sometimes, but even Taiwan. I mean, there are people, but even in the West, there are people that don't want to be seen as religious. But And so they can do it in, in a hidden space. Yeah. Uh, so we create an extra possibility that otherwise would not be there. And not just because of the political situation. I think even here there are people who may not be seen as religious for X or Y reason, and they can do it online. Yeah. There are not many robots. I think we, we have to make a difference between the robots in Buddhist temples in Japan, and I don't know how many are there. If anyone knows, please let me know. And the use of robots in Buddhist temples in China or in Taiwan. Do we have robots in Taiwan? Uh, not yet. Not yet. Okay, I think it's actually, it's slowly on the rise. You see a couple of robots like moving around the temples and say, "Oh, very nice to meet you." Okay, yeah, that's, I'm sorry that's to keep different. you waiting. Yeah, that's a different type. That, that's of robot. a different. I, I think robot. they should start emerging in the next two or three years, as people say. Because to be honest, the CNR somehow die out. Um, I was waiting for more temples to do what Longchuan's have been doing, but partly because of the fate of Longchuan's or that specific temple. Mm. Um, because it's very much in line with the kind of ideology that is going on in China right now. So I, I would have seen a booming of these robots in Buddhist temples, but I don't really see them. I see lots of robots in hotels always taking the elevator and and then bring me stuff to my room. But um, well, I would say one of the issues with um, our expectation of Buddhist robots is the issue of content. In order to train uh, uh, an LLM to a reasonable, um, capable, a level of capability to really converse with you, uh, you have to have at least 10 to 100 gigabytes of information. But usually if you collect the, uh, the works of any Buddhist master from the past, it only sums up to about one or 200 uh, megabytes. That's not so much. And you're looking at um, the LLMs really making in, you know, um, inquiries at about 9 billion tokens per second. Right? There's so much information, uh, so much, uh, such ability to per process so much information, but we're looking at very little input in there. And so as LLMs get really powerful, it is, it's able to analyze large amount of data and actually predict um, the word strings from the data set you, you give to it. But when it's too small, it starts to repeat itself. It starts to repeat itself and starts to become really general. For example, if you ask it, I'm under a lot of stress, what should I do? Right? You're going to get a lot of things like, oh, Buddhist emphasize non-attachment, your feelings are not real, and you know, so you let go. Yeah. You get that a lot in the start. And if you do that, people lose interest. They don't feel like they're getting any spiritual uh, um, guidance. Yes, yeah, so I think at the end of the day, the Buddhist monks around, they need to be aware of the fact that when the robots or the LLMs are able to process such large amount of information, you need to speak with more sense of insight. You no longer speak with information. If you don't speak with insight or wisdom, people don't come to you. And that's what's happening in Japan. If I, if I may, going to LLMs. Come down. Sorry. Yes. Sorry. So my, my understanding of, of Chinese Buddhism is it, it's relatively fluid. Um, sorry. Yeah. My understanding of Chinese Buddhism is relatively fluid, but if you go to Japan, there's various sects, uh, different belief systems. Mm. Who is overseeing the creation of these LLMs? Who's who's sort of regulating their content? Um, and is there equal efforts across various uh, Buddhist groups to sort of give each sort of sect or? Or, or belief, uh, their own sort of opportunity to have an AI. Just very quickly, um, on, on my level, which I know very little, I think it's actually rather decentralized. 
you have each organization working on their own while being piggybacked on the GPTs provided by the large corporations with a, a reasonable amount of information from the internet. So you kind of expand the very limited amount of data you have. So that's the issue. You don't, if, you know, again, coming back to the content of your sect, your sectarian belief, the teachings. And I think right now, probably in Japan, the largest set of Buddhist teachings may be either the Taisho, right, that's the Da Zhenjiang, or um, I think we see a large amount from the Pure Land sect, a lot more compared to all the other sects. That's all I can say. I'm not sure how you feel. Um, um, okay, so in general, it, it opens up a bigger problem. Uh, so um, in Japan, especially, uh, you know, social, okay, so whatever we have, this LLMs and robotics, everything is driven by market forces, right? So uh, who pays for this and how much is available in that market? And then is it worth training this LLM uh, to have that access to the market, right? So these sects of Buddhism, uh, various, uh, they they will look at their market uh, share uh, and then do that with that intention. And then people will have, people will want to, I mean, basically people will demand very soon uh, about the transparency of the data. So, uh, and then I want to know uh what sect, like I'm asking a question about, let's say, Theravada Buddhism. I want to know how authentic this this uh, service is about uh, Theravada Buddhism. Is it is it trained on authentic data or not? So it is, it is it, because these are market-driven, people will demand to have certificates of authenticity. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then they will have the right uh, to know that. And then uh, it it will soon appear because people are paying for it, and then we, that's a good thing about paying for something. Uh, so free GPT, like we don't know what it is trained on, and then you. But if you pay, you will uh, have that access. But I see a bigger problem in the Japanese socioeconomic trends. Um, so I frequently work with them, uh, robotics uh, colleagues, uh, with the aging population in Japan and then especially um, the work uh, like the the now there's a pressure for you know for the for the entire family to work really it used to be somebody works and the other person takes care of family and then now both have to work <laughs> and then they cannot find work in the same city some in some large number of families I was I was so surprised to hear that Nearly about fifty percent of the families, the wife works in one city and then husband works in another city, and then some families are physically separated because they have to work in two different cities. Um, this creates a, a bigger problem now, social problem, uh, and then that has uh, created a new demand for sex robots. Uh, we are really concerned about this. Really, really, our our whole entire community is very concerned about this. What are the ethics uh, uh, limiting this robot? And then can this can this lead to very dystopian future where people won't marry? Like you know, people marry to have a family and children, and with that noble you know sacrosanct um, uh, thing about marriage, will it? No more, no more be there, and then you know, married. You know, it is not relevant anymore. You you buy a robot, right? That is very dark and dystopian. We don't want that society, right? So, uh, for that to happen, we the people should have a good discussion about what it means to be family, what it means to be a society, what it means to be human. Without that dialogue, that deep discussion about true happiness true uh, is that is, uh, the happiness is just sex or like you know it is it is having this you know this um, emotional bond with another human being uh, we don't want to see a, a society where people just marry a robot right so uh, because it is uh, i mean because easily robots can beat humans right so in that sense uh, you can have the most beautiful robots and you know uh, uh, available anytime. We don't need that. Like how to prevent that happening? So spirituality, cultural dialogue, discourse, 
as education in schools and then uh, the, the the deep question about what it means to be human and then what it means to be truly happy so these things should have otherwise uh, the society will be too late by the time they understand that marrying a robot was a very bad idea <laughs> <laughs> and, and there is, and there is some british i i watch a tv series a russian tv series but it was all about that um so yes i think it was russian um somehow from off eastern europe i think i can i will it's on netflix by the way so um yeah, Andy, I'm, I'm gonna, I, mean, I, I said at the beginning that I wasn't just here just to introduce, and I knew I was going to was going to have to ask a question. So apologies. The first one actually is a comment though. That, um, so my former colleague from down the road, Kate Devlin, has written really interestingly around um, kind of soft body robots and kind of intimacy and the relationship between 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 those when uh, her work at Goldsmiths and then then at, at Kings. Um, so I think that's a, it's a fascinating breadth of possibilities in terms of, of human interaction. Now, now if I can segue into my question without that being weird. So, um, so I have a dog and my dog, when I look at my dog and my dog looks at me, I feel that my dog knows what I'm thinking. But I, I know. Agree. I do the same with my cat. <laughs> but, but I know that, I know that there's, there's some miscommunication there. I also have a, a, a son. And and I and I feel the same way about my relationship with my son. There's possibly more miscommunication. <laughs> my, my point my point though is that if I'm communicating with an AI and a robot, and if the AI and robot is just knows me so well that he's going to respond to me in a way that is perfectly tuned to my mm. mannerisms mm -hmm. and my speaking. I don't care what's happening in the inside the machine. Mm -hmm. I care what it's doing to me. Mm -hmm. And what can we say about what these things are doing mm -hmm. to us when they perfectly mm. can simulate an appropriate response? They can make me angry. They can make me sad. We know from the studies of Facebook how effective that can be. Mm. That's the bit that I find terrifying. Mm. It, it is terrifying. Uh, I mean, you have a you have a digital signature in the internet. Uh, whatever you're buying and everything, everything is in the in that uh, phantom in the internet. You cannot delete that. Amazon knows that. Like, let's say, like you go and buy something in Amazon, you open your Facebook, you you will see a very related advertisement. Now, how did it come from? Facebook is different from Amazon. You believe that, right? It is no. They have access to the same phantom of you, and then like these things you buy with your credit card. They go into this phantom, and then let's say if you buy bought a, a bouquet of flowers, and then it is just a transaction. But there are intelligent programs running in the internet that interprets why. And then you hired a cab, and then you know had to go went to a restaurant um, with your wife, and then and it can in, get induced into the wife's phantom too. And then and then what the wife should do in return they will recommend right and so you had you took her to dinner and then had a, a bouquet of flowers and all that and then this is terrifying of course because it's a massive amount of information you are putting into the internet and it is recorded and they are they are all messed up and then they they make inter inferences about that and what you might be doing this is really scary right so this is this is where scholars uh, in our field and other fields should get together and think about ethics and ethical boundaries right so and values can, yeah values mm. and then legal side uh, various dimensions now it is a wild wild west thing right so it is happening literally nobody understands what i am doing i can do anything really uh, uh, i have no legal barriers right it is, I'm self-restricting myself to what I'm doing. Uh, I know this is bad, this is good. But when it comes to market forces, and then it, it is tempting, right? Uh, so, for example, in my own startup company, we have this uh, precision agriculture products. And then we clearly know that our products can be used to improve uh, crop from farms and then that what that means is the land value is going to go up and then people can encroach into the rainforest 
So we self-impose a GPS fence on them. So if you encroach uh, in beyond this fence, GPS fence, our our AI is not going to work. So it 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 works on the other side of the fence, and we have imposed those fences, right? So there's no legal uh, legal uh, obligation for us to do that. So that's why the government should interfere in these AI companies, and then say this is the limit, right? And the politicians have no clue. No clue at all. Uh, so, uh, so politicians, uh, I mean, it is, it is justified, right? So they don't know. They should hire these people who are legal scholars, who who are you know, uh, you know, ethical scholars. Not us. Not us, the culprits. Right? So, uh, the, no, other people should, should, uh, should be hired to think about the boundaries imposed on us. And we are not going to do that because we don't know law. <laughs> and I think this, this is why we have meetings like the one today, uh, not to 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 control to you know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, no, I mean it's okay to be controlled, right? So no, 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 no. Like, but it's a way to have this kind of interdisciplinary. Yeah, of course. This dialogue should. Uh, the, the reason is this dialogue. Uh, I mean, I'm sitting with my. I, I said I'm in the wrong panel because. You are in the right I'm, one. I'm like... You are. You are in the right panel. Everyone's <laughs> listening to you with interest. But can I just quickly respond from the Buddhist perspective? As we speak of a robot that gets along with you and just speaks and acts just to make you happy, and from the Buddhist perspective, we see that as delusion in the disguise of sukha. Sukha as the opposite of dukkha. Right? Dukkha means a disharmony between ourselves and the world. In other words, we suffer when the world or the reality is not happening as, happening as we wish. But when you have that robot in your presence and doing everything to make you happy, it takes away your ability to recognize what is Dukkha. And it takes away your ability to actually deal, find the resilience to deal with these conflicts of thought, belief, and action in our everyday life. And so that anytime you are away from your robot, we might have a lot of trouble because we're so intertwined with our imaginative ego that everything can act just, just as we wish. We lose the ability to deal with dukkha. Yes, yeah, so just very quickly. So I think that's it. That could be the danger behind it. That yeah, that robot at home that makes you happy. Yeah. Okay. Um I'm I'm so oh oh my goodness. I'm I'm the separation of Shinto and Buddhism was in the Meiji period, not after World War II. Yeah. World War II is when the funding... Yes. But yeah, just a correction. <laughs> okay. Uh, I really love all these questions I had, but I wonder if we could pick it up after the coffee break. I'm just concerned that the catering people will come in less than 20 minutes and take all your coffee away. So if it's okay with you, I think we can, we can, the people who want to ask a question, please keep your question in mind and we'll come back and discuss more because I think we are really going into the main core of this meeting, having Buddhism and AI talking to each other and creating something useful. The coffee, juice, everything is outside. Go and serve yourself. Thank you. I saw lots of people talking. That's, that's the spirit. And just to start with, what we were saying before, this is really the right audience. This is really the right panel. Um, we need values. We need interdisciplinarity. We need people from different fields to talk in order to build something that is not just not scary, but is useful, that makes sense. And I think we should keep this in our hand and not let other people. I'm not saying which people, let's say other people. All right. Uh, there were a number of hands. I remember, Ali, you wanted to ask a question. Some other people, you, yeah, and, and more people, and Amal. Um, Ali was the first, so I will, I don't know what you want to talk about. I will use this slide just because it's cute, if that's okay. I'd like to thank the venerables and our uh, professors, distinguished professors, for uh, this marvelous presentation. Um, it's an honor to ask you actually two questions, one from the last session and one for this. The last was, um, 
is there much of an effort going on with digitization of, say, the Pali scriptures or the Mahayana scriptures? And, you know, before the LLMs can be trained, they need to be digitized. And uh, I was curious about the state of digitization in the massive um, libraries and archives of scriptures that were there. And then I'll ask the second question, too, which was for this session, which is um, we, we talked about uh, attachments or skandhas. And uh, if we think about um, the Buddhist uh, account of the arise of sentience or ultimately con awareness and consciousness, it's through this attachment. And um, uh, specifically with uh, Dushantha's, uh work on embodiment, it seems like an embodied AI could indeed form some sort of attachment, which could be dangerous, or would that be a good thing? Would that AI be able to understand us better because it too is attached, uh, has a, a skanta or kanta, I think is the pronunciation. So thank you. Who wants to talk about digi Venerable Miao Guang? And I look at you because do you want me to show some of the slides that you sent? Okay. Uh, which one? Uh, Okay, starting from that page. Okay, from so this one. Okay. okay. You tell me when you change. When okay. I... Okay. Thank you. No, come here. Oh, <laughs> my, 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 my. take your computer. If you okay. Want. Okay. That's easier. Just okay. 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 Um, thank you for the question. Uh, I feel that the LLM at this point um, we are entering a very crucial stage of ensuring that AI gets off a good start. That is to help AI establish right view and right understanding in Buddhism. And so in order to do that, uh, digital preservation plays a huge role, especially as I understand in the world of the Chinese Mahayana Buddhism, we actually began this endeavor about 30 years, 30 years ago. And so starting, the earliest one was actually done by Professor Lewis Lancaster from UC Berkeley when he started a digitization endeavor to digitize the uh, Heinsa temple's 84,000 uh, wooden carved blocks. Uh, so he did it in a very, very interesting way. So to cut the story short, uh, as he started, uh, he realized he needed a lot of funding. And so as he got the funding and got, uh, maybe uh, recruited a few members in America to do that, one day two Buddhist monks from the Choge order showed up at his door. And he said, look, this uh, canon belongs to the Korean. You're an American, so you shouldn't be doing it. And the professor says, oh, fine, you know, if you want to do it, take it. That's what I wanted to initiate. And so two years later, the monks took the project and then went back to him and says, you take it back. We can't do it. <laughs> okay. Yeah, because it's so costly. You have to think about it was actually in the 1970s when word processor was not even um, very common. And so as he thought about what to do, uh, finally, uh, the Choge Order monk gave him an opportunity. He says, you come to Korea. We have two minutes on KBS, Korean Broadcasting System. And you have two minutes to convince the Koreans to support you for this endeavor. Right? If you've convinced them, you have the funding. Okay? So how do you actually convince someone who don't know much about the idea of digitization? So he came up with a very interesting idea. He got up there. He says, well, I have a Korean set of text to digitize, but I don't have the money. And um, in two days, if no one from Korea wants to support me, I'm going to give it to the Japanese. Okay. He said that, and then the wife of um, the founder of Samsung, Sword, woke up his husband in the mid middle of the night and says, look, you need to do something. <laughs> so, um, so Mr. Lee actually ended up uh, funding, giving funding to this project um, on, a, on a basis of two million US dollars per year. So he digitized it. That was the first round. And the second round was actually the C beta, right? the, the Taisho set. Uh, 85 volumes altogether that was digitized in the uh, uh, the late 90s. And then for the Foguang Shen, Foguang Canon. Foguang Canon is a very huge corpus. It consists of 2,000 volumes um, covering 16 canons. And so far we are done with eight. We have about 400 uh, volumes that were all uh, 
digitized as we compile and write them. Because in the early 2000s, the technology of digitization is already very common. But having said that, the Chinese canon, existing Chinese Buddhist canons, um, add up to at least 45. Yeah. And so we've done three. Yay. I, Long Chen is also doing that. Yeah. So we've done three out of the 45. That's where we are. Yep. So hopefully technology will help us move further. And But with the training data coming from the Heingsa uh, set and also C-Beta and Foguang Canon, many people have begun to use this as the training set, the data, to digitize the rest of the Chinese canons. Yeah, so it may take another 20 or 30 years, but um, we are already making very good use of what's already being, di being digitized to train the LLMs. Yeah, so one of them being the Foguang Shan Diction, the Foguang Dictionary. Okay, just very quickly, this is the Foguang Dictionary of Buddhism. In Chinese, it comprises 10 volumes, uh, 32,000 entries, summing up to 30 million Chinese characters. And we've spent the last 30 years translating the key words of the Buddhist canon into English. And so what they look like is you will see the bilingual entries. And so these are also the very important data sets. For us, first of all, it's a Buddhist lexical parallel corpus. So you would imagine this as little dots all across the canon. It's going to light up as we translate them into English and then into other, for example, uh, uh, French or Spanish or Portuguese. Then we are able to train the LLM on a larger uh, scale. And second of all, it's going to serve as a Buddhist canonical rag data. Right, so it's not going to hallucinate, hopefully not. And we'll ask it to really be able to do uh, PhD-based research yeah, to give us information as to how to read or interpret the remaining of the Buddhist, Chinese Buddhist canon. And then thirdly, let's see. And thirdly, uh, some of the functions will still serve as the API. You will see for a term that you see inside as a cross-reference, you don't need to exit. It's just going to pop up. Right? It's going to come to you. So the idea is we can use this to train AI to predict what you're going to read yep. and then prepare that data before you even know you need it. Yeah. So that's where we are. And fourthly, we've recently collaborated with UC Berkeley on a, tra a, a translation uh, uh, tool. Right. And you know all these GPT and LOMs are rising, um, Claude, DeepL, ChatGPT, and you've also got, I think this is French, okay? and you've got Gemini that's kind of rising and Copilot. So everyone is using it. And so with our canon, as well as the dictionary, what we have done to this date is to build the data set as parallel entries. So you can see with Pali to English, 20, 223,000, Sanskrit to English, 820,000, and Tibetan, almost 2 million. And then Chinese to English, uh, humanistic Buddhism, which are the vocabulary uh, for the 21st century created by Venerable Master Xing Yun. So what this function does is, first of all, in this tool, in order to help us further make use of the digitized data set, first, this tool enables what we call semantic search. So when you search Abhidharma, it doesn't just give you Abhidharma or Abhidhamo, or it gives you also what matches in meaning. For example, Dui Fa, right? It says over here, Dui Fa. And so that gives you also the canonical reference to help you feel ensured that you're actually reading reliable and dependent, dependable resource. That's semantic search. And secondly, we've turned it into a linguistic learning tool. So if you are, you know, an enthusiast, 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 you are interested in Sanskrit, Tibetan, Chinese, or Japanese, um, it's actually able to help you analyze every sentence linguistically and in terms of phrase. So in here, you'll be able to see wayfa broken into word strings that are common phrases, or by word by word, and it gives you a word by word explanation to help you um, understand it quote-unquote, correctly, and so that you understand how it goes from fa to all conditioned phenomena are like dreams, illusions, bubbles, and shadows. And next, we go into this multilingual translation function. And so what we're doing here, okay, so I'm just going to come up with a... So basically, uh, with the parallels, you can enter your term here. It's Sanskrit. 
And then you decide whether your source, you tell the system what source language, for example, in this case, Sanskrit, and then I should enlarge it. And then if can it translate into Buddhist Chinese? Okay. So Buddhist Chinese is important because it would actually tell you what the Sanskrit which you can't read is in Chinese. Also with the resources. And so it can also go from Tibetan to Japanese, Chinese to Sanskrit, and many other languages. And so what we do with these becomes an interesting tool for us to help you actually uh, make use and actually learn at the same time. Because what it generates into English, what you certify, becomes the new training data set. Yeah, so this collaboration has been quite important to us for us to digitize and at the same time train the LLM in this time of age. And so we've just begun, as we've said, we probably have explored 5% of the Chinese canon. Yeah, and in the Sanskrit digitization, as I speak to Sebastian from UC Berkeley, he says we've, they've also only tapped into about 5% of the entire Sanskrit literature. Yeah, so a long way to go. But whatever it is that we do to enhance the process, uh, hopefully it will, you know, move everyone along and help us read and access the Buddhist canons better. So the idea is maybe in two years' time, you're going to see a 12-year-old girl in Sweden reading the Avatamsaka Sutra, or maybe a 15-year-old high school student in the UK reading the Abhidharma in English. Yeah, all with thanks to the existing training data we have at this point. Yeah, thank you very much for the question. Well, if I can answer that question right now, but like your question made me think. <laughs> um, so when uh, we have this embodied intelligence, um, people who are interacting with this kind of embodied intelligence uh, will be in a very difficult situation uh, about the sense of agency. Right now, uh, uh, let's say a, a, a little boy or a girl would assign life to a teddy bear. Right? So they think that teddy bear is live and then it, it understands the emotions and then they play with the teddy bear as, as if it is live. And then we, we have this innate capability to assign agency to things, inanimate and animate things, um, this life thing. So when it becomes very close to life, like embodied intelligence, we will be really in a difficult situation. We will assign true life to that, though it doesn't have life or emotions or awareness or anything, consciousness, we will truly, even adults will say, the, my robot is conscious because it's simulating consciousness as presenting consciousness as if it had consciousness. They will be working with them as normal human beings and then partners and even fall in love with them uh, and then uh, uh, trust them more than their friends, human friends, uh, because these, these, uh, these uh, robots will behave as if they are trustworthy. Uh, so... This is this uh, difficult society we are walking into, and then it raises very deep ethical, social, cultural questions that we have to answer now. I don't have the answer now, but like I'm just saying, based on my own research and then the research going on in the rest of the world and the commercial drive, like one X and open AI within, I'm not talking about 10 years. I'm talking about just a couple of years from now. Uh, we will have very new questions about our own civilization, what it means to be human. Uh, I don't know really, but uh, it's up to us, to everybody, right? So non roboticists to think of humanity, especially people in humanities, to question these things about the agency. So, because we have this capability to assign life to things that are really not life. Right, yeah. Very well said, thank you. <laughs> uh, 
Yes, you have been. Re- Do you want to come down or you can yell up to you? Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So actually, I have like two or three questions. So first one uh, is like about the monk community, because we know the AI actually, uh, because I heard uh, like an uh, interview about Zong Sa Qin Zerimbuchi, he mentioned that AI really relates to the identity crisis. So, you know, uh, the in with the AI like developing, so I really curious about what happened to the monk community because monk community is a play a big role in the per, like teaching and uh, preserving the Buddhist wisdom. So uh, like back my home, like my uncles, so he's like a monk. He studied over years in the temples to get a certain like degree in Bo- uh, in Buddhist. So. Uh, what it, what uh, like how they should look at this AI? Uh, because he, uh, the monks like my uncle, they study over years and they learn a lot. Suddenly, there is a machine like named AI, know everything he learned, like spent over years. So, I don't know what what we should consider. Like what 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 well, we should. Think about the monk communities, and the second one is the database, uh, because as uh, so personally, I read some books about Buddhism. Like there are a lot of different schools in Buddhism, so each Buddhism schools hold a different view about certain like Buddhist teaching uh, in different contexts. So when we, uh, of course, like uh, the Buddhist. Uh, AI have to relate to the database. So who gonna to, uh, how to say that, take control of the right or authenticity to give the definition of the uh, teaching to make sure not lead this, uh, how to say, teaching or AI to the wrong direction or even make the different Buddhist community or school uh, like uh, become more tension with each other? Uh, maybe my overthinking. Sorry, uh, no. And uh, the last one is uh, uh, not only I think the AI not only oh uh, the last one is like uh, you sir you mentioned like the AI is kind of like commercial or marketing driving. So how to find the balance because in like. Uh, in the like company who create the machine and the Buddhist master who need or like the people who need the AI machine, how to find the balance? Because when we talk about like marketing or commercialize, they always, I think what uh, to me is more like negative stuff because people always take the profit as the like major consideration. So uh, like how, how the Buddhist master, when they do the cooperation with the other AI company, how they like negotiate or communicate with each other to make sure the AI uh, actually do help for the people, for the normal people to get the teach, get the wisdom of wisdom of Buddha. Yeah, that's my three questions, maybe a lot. Thank you. Thank you. I hope to see more people coming down to the mic and ask the same amount of questions or even more. Thank you. Who wants to go? <laughs> I think I, I talk too much. So I, <laughs> Mahinda, yes. Yeah. Mahinda is. <laughs> I, think, uh, I think she has interesting questions, I think, because when we talk about uh, practice, we are talking about a community you know, the monastics and the lay people, and even within it, like interaction, the family and various units and so on. So, I mean, the young lady gives a very real situation uh, in uh, in whatever the tradition, monk or nun spend years, you know, sometimes you have geshe degrees and which is 12 years, 14 years, and you know, learn like this, train many, many years, it's still training, but, uh, you know, and so that technology, being able to gather that knowledge in a split of a second, 
can be a challenge for human beings, for the community. And actually, this is not a problem only for Buddhist. I mean, I mean the Christianity will face it. And I read a few books uh, on AI. Uh, you know, uh, they are, most of the books I picked up are Christian related, and authors have clearly, or oh, authors are discouraging further research on AI. So the criticism on AI actually coming from Christian based and a Western religion because they have seen that AI become the God, you know, you know, AI taking the place of God in all aspects of life you know, material things and spiritual things and so on. So uh, so it challenged more to uh, Abrahamic religions. Uh, whereas Buddhism and so on sees duty differently. And they see it as a knowledge base, like this nun mentioned about putting all the canon into Chinese characters. And so the machine learned. Uh, correct interpretation of the Mahayana Buddhist tradition. So we see, we approach it in a different way. Uh, but I think, uh, so that you could see this even the religions, even though we, t we like to talk on this AI and religion, but I think each religion responds to a different way. But for Buddhists, have less worries because we are selfless, you know? You know, we are ultimately selfless. Even what we call Buddhism is we ha its absence, yeah, shunyata, emptiness, or whatever. So we don't have to really to hold into a very strict idea. Whereas the Abrahamic religion is not the same. So Islam probably is, will come out very strongly against its one that's come to it. Especially the idea of a robot doing the prayer will be very terrible for Islamic person, I guess. This is my guess, I assume, because somebody, you know, robot doing the prayer would be terrible. So, but nevertheless, your question is relevant to Buddhist community. What will happen to the monks and nuns? And what will happen to the temples around the world? Because, because this tourist industry and also preservation and conservation is actually done with the, the, most of the time, the monks and the associate people, yeah? So kind of... Imagine that stage, what will happen to this conventional bodies is a real one. But nevertheless, we can be very happy if we think about knowledge as the foremost, then AI has the advantage, you know, to be like, say, I saw you those photos. Uh, in, it's less than a few minutes. It produced, it gave me, I mean... It's amazing. I mean, without I give a few words like, you, you know, if you give a human student those students... We will not be able to do that, but the machine is able to articulate it in a more creative way. There is this advantage. So I think this identity crisis is a serious one. The community will have a serious issue. Now about the schools, different schools, I think there are, so, even within one school, like for example, the nun uh, already mentioned earlier that this LLM what is available is more Jojo Shinshu, pure land type of knowledge base now. So that means even within Mahayana tradition like uh, Japan, Shingong, and uh, other small schools, Jodo Shu, and you know, they, they are not represented. And same argument we can make it from Theravada tradition. Like, say, for example, Fogwans have done this all this canon, but the Theravada traditions is a very difficult situation because, of course, English is the first language the AI will get, and now probably Chinese or Japanese or Korean, but South Asian languages like Pali or Sinhala or Thai will be underrepresented. So they will be, uh, you know, if you, if you think about the history of Buddhism, how the Buddhism came to the West and it acquired and so on, so this will challenge to the status quo in some ways to the, uh, you know, what is Buddhism and how Buddhism is represented, how it's interpreted and so on, uh, not only within a certain Buddhist group, but other groups so like South Asian Buddhists and Tibetan Buddhists also to some extent will be isolated in this because they are not the leading, of course, he's a Sri Lankan man, but 
that come in it from only the scientific side. So, so this Buddhist side, like for example, if you take a Theravada Buddhism, even today, you know, politics society was established 1881. Very handful singular texts are available in English readers, less than five out of many, many texts, for example. I mean, this, this is kind of one example. And even in the Chinese case, up we are talking about here canon, but there are other literature, folklore and so on, you know, there are a lot of, and then some, some literature is contesting the authority of Buddhism and so on, it's all countries. So that's not represented in this knowledge base. So, so here, as intellectuals, we have a question, who is speaking, how that person is speaking, and, and what kind of interpretation that person bringing in, all these interesting issues mm -hmm. arise there because uh, uh, this, this language learning, the machine language learning not equal or democratized mm -hmm. or financially not available. So, so I have some more other ideas, but I will stop here. Thank you. So maybe uh, I can give you from a lay, uh, lay person's point of view. So when... I was born uh, to a Buddhist family in Sri Lanka, but I was I I I don't think I practiced any Buddhism, right? So I went with my mother to the temple and then chanted the gathas, and I didn't understand any of that. Uh, and then I was told, yeah, this is that that um, yeah the Bodhi, and that was my Buddhism, right? So, but when I wanted to really uh, understand Buddhism. I did it very seriously. So in 2010, after the Sri Lanka's war came to an end in 2009, um, I was playing some part, a uh, role in the Ministry of Defense. Uh, and then in 2010, I was deeply questioning um, my my role in the war and then my my experience and my, uh, as an academic, uh, I was deeply troubled. And then I, I, I thought, Nikan, like just a just a glimpse like uh, i thought buddhism may have an answer for my issues and then i went to walked into a monastery and then uh, before talking about any buddhism i just saw these monks okay. and then nuns and then i just saw their faces and they were more you know pleasant and the the words they were talking were very grounded and very light and I was attracted to that. That is my real entry to Buddhism. So I'm a I'm a I'm a I'm a person who is converted from Buddhism to Buddhism. <laughs> so, uh, and then I went in search of the people who can truly teach me. So it is a it is a gavashana, right? So it's a, it's a the person who really wants to know Buddhism will go in search of Buddhism. Uh, so I don't have a worry. What is available on the LLM? What is available on the internet? Um, uh, what is available on an AI app? Will um, decide the availability of Buddhism. It is not the person who really wants to understand Buddhism will go in search of Buddhism. It doesn't matter where it is, right? So I went to Thailand. I went to. Um, I flew to northern Thailand, um, uh, Wat Padara Chat, and stayed in these monasteries, practiced uh, the monastic uh, traditions. I went to Amaravati. And then the those, like, I don't know, me, and then I met other people, we go in search. Right? We don't just do uh, internet search. right? So it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Flying to the other side of the world, we will do that. Uh, so people who, I mean, Buddhism is not a populist religion. Uh, it is it is for those people who want to investigate, question, and then they, they will go in search of that. I'm not worried about what is available on an AI app or anything. That is superficial. Uh, Maybe it, 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 it will be for those, you know, very reckless people who wants to, you know, just get something or, you know, confirm their own biases or something. AI will help uh, to retain these things uh, true, but that is not the entire story, right? Uh, so if there's a monk in a forest, middle of a forest, who is very silent, but who who knows it, we will go in search of that person. So basically, all the situation that we had before AI 
are still going on at the time of AI. Um, the only difference would be we are we are already in a society that is very much based on technology and I'm just back from China uh, and, and everything is through WeChat. You do everything through WeChat. You don't, you know, every, that, that's the starting point and, and the end point of, of many human activities. So that I think would be the difference. And, and I fully agree that it depends whether or not you want to go to a temple or you want to rely on AI data. But we are entering a, a time where in certain societies, uh, maybe less in the UK, I may say, but I'm not even British, so I don't dare to say that. Uh, but what I see in China, digital is the beginning and the end of all the human activities. And uh, that's where AI can become a little bit more tricky. Um, can I? Yes, sure. I think there was a question here about the right. You know, ITC says that each British school hold different views. Who is going to take the right perspective or something like that. This is an uh, important one because now the knowledge that AI produces at the moment is nobody guard it, nobody uh, controls it. Mm -hmm. And 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 usually as you like know, Wikipedia. Hmm? Yeah, Wikipedia, yeah. Because I mean we tell students uh, not to use Wikipedia. Students cannot use Wikipedia. If any student of source is here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, the reason is because it doesn't have a guard because anybody could update things. So the whole issue is authenticity or the truth. You know, in the academy, usually we talk about references and the sources and so on. Now, AI so far, I think it's not, maybe it will get into it, but in terms of plagiarism, in terms of identifying the real owner, mm -hmm. so respecting the intellectual property, uh, and and all of these are very important uh, because the uh, kind of the AI at the moment invading private rights and also the you know like presses for example presses have a lot of books published they invest in it in public because usually some books don't sell more than 10 copies you know some some books you know lucky you if you, if you publish a book you know lucky if you get 300 copies out and so the so the publishers and so on the authors royalties or the authors gets a little bit money not a lot of money well, you had to write a novel uh, but academic do not get any money but now the issue is there you know, kind of, the, are, are our intellectual labor acknowledged? You know, uh, you know, we, as as the, the sister said, that, you know, monks spend so many years to get this knowledge and AI can get it in quickly. And in the same way, intellectuals who work on Buddhism or other texts, and they, they have devoted whole life to write 10 pages of article. And now, even if that person's name disappeared from the scene, are we really grateful and acknowledging that commitment? Well, that's a moral question I have. And so this issue of right, you know, respecting the right and integrity of the work and the truth and the fairness, transferability, these are issues that I have mm -hmm. problem with. Well, I have to say these are issues that didn't start it with AI. Uh, even before, scholars of media and communication have been debating this for decades already. Uh, the authority, the central authority that before uh, could have been a Buddhist monk or a Buddhist nun in a temple, could be a priest in a church, that was the authority, one authority. There was a sort of central one person. But, but then with the media, you have a decentralization. So you have more authorities and you don't have a sense of authenticity. So that's something that has started before and AI being in that path has somehow inherited as well. I see question and uh, yeah, Amal has been waiting for an hour and a half. So, <laughs> and I have to. There's a raised hand there. Uh, thank you, Stefani. So, uh, mine's a, a bit of a, a reflection as well as a question. Um, so, you know, uh, um, the West especially has learned quite a lot from Buddhism say, for example, in the area of mindfulness, um, you know, they've they've taken mindfulness, but they've somewhat 
made it a very secular tradition. So to a certain extent, they've taken out the wisdom, the values, uh, and they're, they're they're teaching mindfulness in in lots of places. Uh, and I'm wondering, really, without um, and this is a problem for everything, but AI particularly, without wisdom, without value, um, where does this AI take us? Okay, uh, and you know, I think we've heard comments from the panel that a lot of the um, the things behind these robots that are coming out will be financial, will be money. So there's obviously greed at the heart of some of this. So I'm wondering really whether, you know, us coming to a conference at SOAS, a brilliant conference, uh, and we're learning about uh, what impact AI has on Buddhism, and really whether it should be turned around, and whether we as Buddhists should be going to a conference where AI people, scientists, or people constructing AI should be learning about the values that Buddhism can have and impacting on, on them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, uh, are you asking? Yeah, yeah, you are. <laughs> uh, I mean, we would love to have uh, that kind of a conference. We don't get that privilege. Uh, to, to it's supposed to be this conference, by the way. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so lots of my friends and uh, we are really deeply questioning about uh, the emergence uh, of intelligence and then the the limit of intelligence and things like that. So we uh, we at least in my community we believe that there's a limit, uh, and then awareness is something we will never tap into. Uh, consciousness is something that will never be in any of the robots we are making, and then it is impossible. We know that it is for reasons. Uh, we want to have this conversation with uh, uh, people who practice meditation, and then some of us who practice, you know, do robotics and meditation. We we have this uh, dialogue in professional conferences already. And there's a huge interest to understand this formations of sankara, and then uh, you know, uh, co like action and lead into sankara that that link. And um, so there's yes, just last night I, I had a, um, we had a meeting with the JPL NASA Jet Propulsion Lab. So we we NASA is sending this mass colonization robots that go to. Uh, far away planets uh, to explore life and then do constructions. We cannot have regular conversation with these robots. We cannot have uh, remote control from Earth. And then these robots have to be intelligent on their own. And then what kind of intelligence we should be uh, embedding into them. Uh, I cannot disclose too many things, but like I can just say that we are truly concentrating NASA, JP, JPL, and we are... Um, I spent last month there, and then uh, we are thinking about these in intelligent beings sent to planets. Uh, and then we are coining a new term called arbitrated mechanical intelligence. It will be um, mostly we are, we are early stages of thinking. Uh, it will be widely discussed at NASA. So... Uh, it the the uh, the question about uh, uh, the the because these are driven by money. Uh, uh, why we do space uh, exploration? It is driven by money. Uh, SpaceX is a good example. The I I have to assure that like you know it it will be limited to a market, a palatable market. Right, so these these mindfulness apps and mindfulness AI will be just um, reaching out to young people, uh, busy people who doesn't have the time to dive deep into Buddhism. Uh, they don't have the time to understand the deep spiritual meaning of Buddhism. So it used to be like you know Buddhism used to be a very niche thing and then those people who had the time to investigate could understand that a, maybe a lifelong investigation most young busy people with quick gratification driven things they 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 don't have the time for that to do meditation or anything so they might 
do this fitbit and then you know go to gym and then um listen to some mindfulness music and i think even that bit is enough for them to give a taste of mindfulness so the ai will be will be will be largely limited to this market of entry level mindfulness it is it is not going to take over or it is not going to uh, be a complete substitution to uh, the role a monk would play uh, you go to a monk to have a deeper conversation right so you you don't go to an app to do a deeper conversation you go oh yeah so you calm me down like i pay for you that's it right so um, um, <laughs> like so that the, that market will be captured i think that is at least a good thing they will have a taste of uh, mindfulness and then they will enter the deeper spirituality at some point my my kids are the best example so we i took them to uh, a weekend retreat in uh, in a temple uh, but they were playing around like but i i knew that they were playing around in a temple at least they they get this experience of this silence the the kindness the compassion it is in the air let them play but like in within that uh, that environment now they are telling me like you know i want to go and you know shall we go i want to go back to that monastery there's something i feel and i said something i felt and it is missing in my life and then they now go deeper into that way later right so i think that is fine so this is okay uh, ai will do that market entry and then give that taste that's 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 fine but if i and, and then i um, and, and venerable uh, miao guang also wanted to respond to the previous questions but if i may just jump in for a second i think the point uh, yes of course trying to use buddhism as a background values for the creation of ai in the buddhist sphere but i think i would love to challenge that and go a step forward and think of buddhism affecting ai in general um ai is is not just the robot that you find in the hotel or or in a buddhist temple ai can control drones in war for instance ai can be used in, in different spheres of society and and so the, the the question is how to shape it in a way with values in this case buddhist values that may make it more fruitful less scary less dangerous uh, so values like emptiness and equality which are pretty much at the core of buddhism so how can you translate that in an algorithm and how that can become foundation of uh, the general ai so even moving outside the buddhist sphere so that's something that is is in my mind and i hope uh, maybe not today the second meeting <laughs> on buddhism and ai but it's something that we should and then and here we are discussing buddhism and ai there are there are universal values that are shared by different religious and philosophical traditions so it would be even better to have even a more interreligious intercultural conversation to find a way that this ai is based on values that is acceptable by everyone uh, but that's just something in my mind um venerable miao wang you wanted to okay. comment on the previous one Oh yes, I, I just felt like I need to respond to your first question. What impact will AI have on the Sangha community? Um, are you from a Asian, East Asian background? Tibet. Oh, okay. And so imagine if today we've entered into that phase where robots can do chanting. Yeah. Okay. They can actually give you teaching. And unfortunately, someone respected and very loving, whom you love much, pass away, passes away in your family. Who would you go to for the chanting? The robot or the sang or the monk? The monk. Indeed, right? Because imagine if you're from an East Asian uh Buddhist background and your grandma deeply believes, believes in the western pure land. She says if I die, make sure you do chanting for me so that that I can be re be reborn in the western pure land. Then you bring out a robot and say, "Look, they chant really well. No, no, they can chant 40 sutras for you in a day, you know." Yeah, and go for it. And then in the middle of the night, your grandma will probably come into your dreams and say, hey, I can't find Western Pure Land because there's no merit. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So so this is my answer to you. You know, what impact will AI have on the Sangha community? 
What AI would never affect、um, the Sangha community is in terms of what we call merit or punya, because the Sangha means a harmonious community that practices together to generate "quote unquote" goodness, right? Virtue, right? Punya from our physical, mental, and verbal speech. So it is that energy in a spiritual practitioner that is generated through the human consciousness. AI cannot have that. Yet AI can only assist us in、um, the initial contact or reception of anyone who needs guide to go deeper into the Dharma. But at the end of the day, it's still up to the virtuous act and the inspirations that a sangha gets. Through his or her or their personal everyday experiences, to rise above the knowledge. So、um, I wanted to show a slide that、um, gives us a、um, a chart between、um, this one. Yeah. Yep. So you can see,、um, although、um, on the surface we're looking at the development of AI, going from ANI, right,、um, artificial neural intelligence,、um, the earlier robotics that do simple tasks repeatedly, that's at the AQ, IQ of about twenty, and then we're moving into physical AI, which is in the next two years when the ro robots can multitask and kind of respond and predict your actions. And then, if we are fortunate enough to really see the rising of AI, artificial、uh, general、uh, AGI, general intelligence, that is, AGI will be able to pass every single test on the earth, on the surface of the earth, within five years. That is, it's going to surpass any existing knowledge of human beings.、Uh, that's AGI. So we worry about that. But what if people are thinking maybe in two thousand ninety nine ASI artificial super intelligence comes around to help us see that it's able to think beyond just the knowledge level, which is、um, it's going to start answering philosophical answers, spiritual answers, and so on. Because even human when human beings start feeding information to these models they're going to start learn from each other they've started to bypass all these systems and to learn from each other all the systems existing and so can you click on it again so we want to see oh there it is so can you see on top right i see it as in the development of ai we're looking at nyana Right, knowledge. You acquire knowledge. You share knowledge. But when you're moving to perhaps in the middle between nyana and、um, pranya, you see between A and I, physical AI and AGI. So can AI really move into the level from knowledge into higher wisdom or higher insight? That is what we are discussing today, isn't it? So we've already come to the senses that AI would never have awareness. So no awareness, no consciousness. But By consciousness, we're going to have to say the embodiment of AI will not give it the definition of life in the Buddhist perspective, because Buddhism coins life as consciousness that has to link from past life, present life to future lives. So, how do you give AI a past, present, and future life? That we can think about that. So, in other words, these definitions between AI. In the form of life, and what the Buddha's teaching are、uh, referring us to, to the higher status of awareness, that oneness, which in which we exist with all living beings through this great sense of compassion and equality. Right? How how are we able to guide AI into achieving that without giving it the ability to experience life and to interact li with life on an autonomous level? That would be my question. So, if it cannot really proceed to the status, the status of prana, then there is no bud. You cannot awake. AI cannot become awakened. So,、um, while the,、uh, the impact of AI on the sangha community can happen on an everyday basis, but I think on a spiritual level. You know, just with merit, right? You would go to a Buddhist monk for chanting. That's where you receive the merits because we're the field of sangha, right? You wouldn't go to the the robots for chanting the Diamond Sutra fifty thousand times to get fifty times the the merit, right? If you believe in that, then there's no impact. Yeah. And、um, secondly, can I just quickly、uh, talk about the compatibility of AI with Buddhism?、Um, I think with what we have heard. Um, can Buddhism influence AI? I would say right now, if we want to regard Buddhism as a universal value, it should offer space for every single belief and practice and science. Yeah, and so I think there's no problem with many of us, you know, believing that. And so、um, when I hear you say, you know, your kids 
start to want to go to the monastery. Right? Obviously, they saw something good in it. And I think at this point, AI can provide that sense of comfort through the means of upaya, right? skillful means. Upaya means to make Buddhism accessible. Accessible to more people who may have trouble learning or um, understanding or who need more time for this information to be disseminated to you again and again and again. That's why you go to YouTube to listen to a talk three times. Because a Dhamma, a Buddhist monk, will not sit down in front of you and give the same talk three times. Right? So we would say, yes, technology is there, AI is there, and that it will offer all kinds of skillful means to really help us. For example, guided meditation for those who are interested, right? beginners. And if anyone persists through the consistent practice of meditation, like what you said, they're going to evolve. They're going to evolve into searching deeper practices through inquiries with Buddhist monks, as well as the sutras. And translations of sutras help you make the sutras more accessible. And you've got websites who share information with people worldwide. Yeah. And so I believe in the form of upaya, that's where Buddhism can affect AI, you know, to offer the accessibility and to make it a more friendly environment, right? to make people comfortable when they enter the ground of the Dharma or Buddhism. And secondly, AI can support mindfulness and meditation practices. Uh, like we've said, um, whether the headband works for you or not, um, it, it is a, a, a gateway to help us understand how the mind works and to help us gauge where our thoughts are right now. But then you have to go through the proper instructions to help yourself remedy such mental activities. And thirdly, AI can help us preserve and spread the Dharma, as we've said, not just canonical text. I wish the Buddhist masters from the past were alive today. What if they were there to actually give you the teaching on a personal basis? Right? And so right now we can rely on AI to provide a hologram, right? a, a responsive bot, or maybe um, a friendly um, Q&A conversation to help us move closer to the master. These are all on the surface. And so can we influence AI on the surface? Like I said, if we are able to instill right view and right thought into all of these tools people are developing, then maybe the effect, the influence can begin. So just my responses. Thank you. Yes. Um, I will try to respond to your first question, follow Miao Guang Fa Shi, uh, based on Buddhist philosophy. Uh, because I uh, always uh, say that uh, my English is not good enough because I'm working and teaching in Department of Chinese Literature. Huh. So uh, my Buddhism and the Buddhist practice is not good enough because I'm not a monk. Huh. So uh, I try to respond based on Buddhist philosophy. It's, um, it's a cool a theory, fundamental theory of Buddhist philosophy is a depend origination, uh, which asserts that all things are impermanent. So this is also applied to our living world, uh, with life taking on different forms as uh, hist history progresses, never maintaining a fixed pattern. So. With the current advancement in technology, AI is becoming an indispensable tool or condition for human, human future. According to Buddhist philosophy, everything arises and ceases based on various conditions. And AI too manifests within the framework of dependent origination. So Buddhists can openly accept the arrival of AI through the perspective of depend or origination. In other words, from the viewpoint of this principle, Buddhist community, uh, uh, in your word, monk community, is capable with the AI and could accept it. However, it is important to carefully consider that is excessively relied on AI could lead to another form of extreme view, which it could be incapable, uh, incapable with Buddhist emphasis on the middle way. So this is my 
point of view to re re respond to your first question uh, based on the Buddhist philosophy. Thank you. Thank you, Weihong. I thought you wanted to show the, the slide. Not yet. Yeah, no. Not yet. Good. Uh, yes, uh, there were plenty of hands. Sorry. Uh, Venerable Chui Qian, you also had a question, right? Just a comment. Just a domestic uh, question about AI. Yes. Uh, what do you think about the AI and the speakers? But uh, just a short comment is that um, in general, for monastics, there are two roles. The first role is the goal. The second role is the mission. So the goal is for us to become a monastic, as what the Bible says, is that um, our goal is to have ultimate enlightenment and parry nirvana. Mm. Right? That's our goal. So AI, no matter how AI uh, developed, it would help us to have parry nirvana. That's for the goal. That's for the mission. But the mission is that um, we use AI to do a translation. It helps us a lot. We use AI to design for book cover. We use AI to come up with the deadline. All these are for the propagation of Dharma, continuing the Dharma will. So again, it's just a tool. So the problem is not uh, from the AI. The problem is we humans. If we rely on AI, designing the color, we will forget how to design things. <laughs> if we rely on AI to do the translation, which is good, it helps us a lot, but maybe one day we forget about a lot of wordings. So there are advantage, there are disadvantage. There's always half and half this world. So who guides, not the AI, who guides us? I think that's the, uh, my comments about your question. Is the monastic's role has to be clear. Thank you. Thank you. And, it, and it goes back also to what uh, Trishanta said at the very beginning. I mean, AI is we make AI. I mean, it's, it's a tool we create. Don't worry, we are tool makers. So, <laughs> we can't do it. so the, the thing is, we have to make the tools in the right way. Um, uh, yes, him first and then Ali. Uh, can you speak? Sure. What is your definition of consciousness? Oh, you may beautiful. Think that AI never will be conscious because the Australian philosopher mind David Chambers says one day AI can be conscious. Uh, so we still struggling, you know, philosophically. You know, is the definition of consciousness? <laughs> is is he living? Uh, is an Australian philosopher. David Chalmers. David Chalmers. Yeah, I think I, I'm, I'm happy to have a conversation with this person. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so if he if he says AI will be conscious one day, either he doesn't understand AI or he doesn't have no clue about what consciousness is. <laughs> uh, but to go, uh, in, say in a different way, I think we... What is your... The definition of consciousness. Exactly, that's uh, the problem. I mean, so, sorry, the Buddhism is very clear, right? Consciousness. Uh, the the word Buddha used for consciousness is vinyana. Vinyana arises at contact. Tinnan uh, pasa, uh, right? So it is like you have a sensory stimulus, you have sensory organ, and then you have this uh, contact and then vinyana arises at that point and the vinyana is relative to that contact so it is that differentiated awareness about like there's something exists and i exists right so that creation of i and the illusion of something so it is that it's a differentiation of the awareness so, but it it came from the awareness itself. Like for ex I, I gave the example of the of the dark space. The light was there already in the dark space, but we didn't know that. Uh, we we see light through the moon, right? So that when the moon passes above us, we see the moon, and then it created a moon and a me here. So that is vinyana. That is consciousness. The moon created me. Okay, so I didn't know that I existed, 
before I, I saw the moon. If everything disappears, I disappear because I, I have nothing to, I don't have a footing uh, to identify myself. So uh, it's all the time, it is my creation of me is relative to the sensory uh, experience I have. So uh, uh, AI doesn't have access to that light, uh, the, the, which is awareness, uh, the field of awareness we have. I mean, Buddha was so clear about this, the description of awareness, he says, at the first entry point, the stream entry, uh, a person experiences this this glimpse, the qualities of awareness, and they I understand that awareness has no gender, it has no culture, it has no age, it has no social identity. And so you break completely break down this, um, you know, sakaya ditti, the idea of oh, this identity relative to these socially conditioned labors, because awareness doesn't have that identity, right? Uh, so that then you understand, oh, that is my true refuge. Right. And then you can go to that refuge. AI can never walk to that refuge because AI doesn't, it is an emerging property. It's the emergence of mathematical equations being run in different parts of a server, uh, in different, you know, CPUs. And then those mathematical equations don't know that they exist. And then that is why they cannot have any access to any kind of awareness. If I may, I think scientists have only just made a bold map. I think it was a fruit fly, a fruit fly mm. brain. We don't. There's so much we don't understand about the human brain that we potentially will in the future, mm -hmm. and how that relate that that is very much connected to potentially not necessarily the Buddhist concept of consciousness, but at least scientifically, objectively, the scientific view of consciousness uh, yeah yeah i mean science, scientific uh, scientist um, because we cannot uh, reach any consciousness we have our own definition of consciousness which is a convenient escape um like so we think oh yeah being able to interpret this uh, senses and uh, fusion of senses is consciousness like i mean i'm telling my my colleagues <laughs> don't don't cheat yourself <laughs> right so we are cheating ourselves right uh because we can never understand consciousness we define our own consciousness which is which is which is really um, i don't know like that's why i said like so i'm really happy to have a conversation with that australian philosopher yes he's a well known um, uh, philosopher in mind and <clears throat> also I mean, and in Buddhism, we still, you know, are struggling whether consciousness can be biologically, you know, in, uh, emerging property of the nervous system, or whether it can be occurred based on algorithm uh, in the future. So there's a, you know, problem whether we can, you know, whether we be able to, you know, define the consciousness properly scientifically. You know, the mainstream, you know, idea nowadays, uh, uh, you know, uh, the concept of consciousness is solely emerging property of the nervous system. It is not a so, bottom, like scientists uh, argue that it is a, it is an emerging property. Uh, it is an emergence of uh, uh, bottom-up activity, of uh, neural activity, uh, things like that. But... Um, Clear, uh, let's say from a Buddhist point of view, at least without awareness, there's nothing to project on that sensory experience. There's no consciousness. But uh, uh, yes, sense of fusion can happen, everything, but none of them will be aware of any other components existing there. So, but we are we are aware of uh, the context and then the AI is not aware of the context. That's why it is dangerous because it doesn't know whether it is doing a, a right thing or a wrong thing. It is. It doesn't know about ethics or anything. So that's 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 the thing. So uh, I mean, we can have different definitions of consciousness, but 
Buddha was very clear about what consciousness is. And scientists don't have that. <laughs> if if I can jump and and I know and 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 uh, Wei Hong and 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 then Venerable Miao Wang also have something to say. I have a kind of deja vu because I was in 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 our research team, uh, the group of SARS at Georgetown, and and the word consciousness was coming up a lot. And then there was someone say, "What do you mean by consciousness?" So to speak about consciousness is like to speak about ethics. Was that? Uh, and then, indeed, the scientists have their own definition. Um, philosophy of mind, it depends which they have another definition. Within Buddhism, uh, there is a kind of general background definition, but then each school has their own take on that. And I think that's what we found. I know you are the expert, so I'll <laughs> the mic to you. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Maybe I can approach the question of uh, whether AI possesses consciousness by considering uh, in, in its relation to karma. Uh, it, that is why Stefania said that uh, when we're talking about the AI, whether the AI have uh, possessed consciousness that is related to, related to ethical problems. So in the Buddhist framework, the, the actions of body, speech, and mind generate karma, which follows the law of cause and effect. This is, means that karma and the, the circle of birth and death are product through the action of body, speech, and mind. However, while, while AI can perform action of body and speech, its actions of mind are governed by the uh, algorithms also, also, although scholars have a debate whether AI possess consciousness, if we see aside uh, the complex discussion in neuroscience and the focus solely on the st structure of karma, it may be easier to understand uh, how Buddhist views, uh, the Buddhism views the question of whether AI have consciousness. This is, I think, this is a logical issue. Um, when we say the actions of body, speech, and mind produce karma, uh, it implies that none of these three can inde uh, independently to be sufficient condition of for karma. If this doesn't help us to make a, a judgment, we can apply to the logical method of deny, uh, denying the consequence if there is no karma, then there is no action of body, speech, and mind. Therefore, we only need to examine whether AI have, has karma or is experience of the circle of birth and to infer whether it has consciousness. The answer is very clear. Based on the current development of AI, it seems we cannot affirm that AI has karma or undergoes the circle of birth. Uh, therefore, it seems unnecessary to claim, uh, claim that AI has consciousness, uh, even though its action of body, speech, and mind may closely resemble those of humans. So uh, I also replied this um, question based on the Buddhist philosophy uh, focus on the concept of karma. So I think the, the, the answer uh, may be uh, different from the scientific uh, neuroscience. So, but, but I think it is a simply a logical issue. Thank you, it's my opinion. Okay. Yeah, um, I would just like to provide another perspective of how we understand consciousness from Chinese Mahayana Buddhism, well, partly Mahayana. Uh, that is from the Yogacara school. The Yogacara school uh, categorizes consciousness into eight levels. Right? The first six, eye, ear, nose, tongue, body, and the brain, are the sensory consciousness, uh, which we have covered a lot in very excellent ways today. And the second type of uh, awareness is actually called uh, mental consciousness. That is, after the data is received through the first six doors, right, even the brain processes it and labels it with certain kinds of concepts. For example, 
I drink out of this, therefore it's a cup. Right? And therefore, it enters into the mental consciousness, which is the seventh, which takes it as a subjective experience, which is what they refer to, uh, our, our panelists, not they, I'm sorry, um, what our panelists have referred to as a first person or awareness or subjective experience. So right now, we're not able to prove that AI has that subjective experience. It's really based on the information that is fed to it. and But what human beings do is at that level, they transform that experience, the concept, the level, into that sense of I, right? the subjectiveness. And it's from there all the data begins to transform based on your previous encounters or experiences with what actually happened to that. Mm. Uh, I always use the experience. If you walk into a, a hotel or restaurant, and on a plate, a silver plate, you see a white, round, glistening ball. Right? What do you think it is? Many of you will say it's ice cream, right? Because the last time you ate ice cream, it was a white, round, glistening ball. Yeah, so you believe it's ice cream. That's the subjective experience. So you take up the spoon, you take a scoop, you put it into your mouth until you realize it's actually margarine. You've taken a big, sco you know, a big scoop and put it into your mouth and you go, ew, gross. Right. Then you get angry. You said, hey, why, why isn't this ice cream? So I guess in this process, right, believing it to be ice cream, eating it as ice cream, and then getting angry at the fact that it's not ice cream, it's not present in AI. Right? It would only analyze uh, what material, what ingredients are in there, but it's not going to get angry. Yeah. So that's the seventh level. When it becomes subjective, you seem to kind of want to take actions depending on your own decisions, not an informed decision, not an awareness decision. And then all of this experience goes into the eighth, which is the Alaya Vinyana, right? It, which is referred to as the storehouse. That is, all of your past actions and experiences and memories are kind of kept in this level of consciousness. And it's like your hard drive. Next time these first six doors prompt you to go through a similar experience, you're going to call out that memory from the hard drive and have a similar experience. So we call this tendency. Yeah. And AI cannot be proven to have that kind of tendency because anytime you feed it new data, well, you ask it one question and it will give you 10 different questions you know, through the seconds. It never thinks or behaves in the same way, but human beings do unconsciously. That's the sad thing. We carry so much memory on us and we don't know how to use it. We let it take over us and we believe that is me. That is the life I carry from past life into the present, into the future. Yeah. So in these eight definitions of consciousness, it still gives a very clear pathway to how our mind interacts with this world, what we call reality, consciousness. And But the sad thing is, our mind is going from the 6th to the 7th and the 8th. That is our key point to attaining enlightenment. Anytime you transform into awareness, you will no longer take any of this experience as the self. But with such a super intelligent system, what do we do with it? Every day, we let it drive us around trying to fulfill our desires, to dream in our delusions. We let this intelligence work against us. Then we turn to AI and say, can you solve my problem? Yeah, so that's the dilemma in there. Yeah, so if we see the consciousnesses on all these eight levels, we can begin to think about where we can really work to elevate our awareness through the seventh or the eighth. Yeah, so just really quickly to an, an answer to your question on how we define consciousness from the Yogacara perspective. Not one definition. <laughs> As I say, it's really deja vu. Um, Ali, sorry. I just uh, wanted to address the address Amal's. I wanted to address Amal's point about um, philosophers and uh, practitioners of Buddhism feeding into the engineering community. I'm a member of the IEEE Standards Association. The IEEE being the Institute of electronics uh, and electrical engineers, and we make standards. And um, a few years ago, uh, we launched a series called the 7000 series, and this relates specifically to autonomous systems, i.e. AI. And uh, the very first one, IEEE 7000, is ethical standards uh, for the development of autonomous systems. And we actually looked at 
many traditions, ethical traditions, including Buddhism, but the 7,000 series continues. Uh, there are more and more standards coming out. And this is an opportunity for philosophers and other stakeholders to get involved in the development of engineering standards. Um, there's a, a recognition now amongst engineers that we need to have ethical engineering, and engineers are not trained in ethics. So there, there are four up that have already launched and that are being developed. And I think I would encourage everyone who wants to, you can contact me if you want to know how to get involved, but they are there, but they need to grow. Can I have a follow-up? Please. So, yeah. So, sorry, uh, it's Tim. So, um, following up from that, so if we assume like, like the Buddhist principles, like I take a precept not to kill, I press it, take a preset not to steal, not to tell lies, misconduct. Can uh, an AI bot, robot, actually assume those values so that in the actions that they take, they will not do those things? Does that make sense? Uh, the, the... <laughs> <laughs> we want you to create a Buddhist AI before we finish the session. Sushant, I'm sorry. <laughs> so there's there's a movie called iRobot, uh, and then that uh, that whole movie is about uh, uh, the telling the story about how a robot find a loophole um, in the three uh, tenants uh, of uh, who I forgot. Uh, the the laws of uh, uh, AI uh, whose laws are the uh, Asimov's Asimov's uh, laws uh, the the robot will not uh, endanger itself and then uh, uh, in 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 or something like you know basically not harm other people uh, and then obey the orders of the master the uh, the human. Uh, but it found a way to get through that uh, because it it, it interpreted um, uh, a self defense as a good thing for the other person too. Uh, and then, like, if if it is good for the other person, like let, let's say it, it can say, I I'm, I'm let's say like punishing, right? So teachers can punish students, and then you can say that is bad. But then the teacher can say, no, I'm students because it is good for the student and the robot can argue that I'm going to crack that person's head uh, because it's good for that person because that dumb <laughs> brain should not be <laughs> right so one what happens I say it had a logic it had it had an argument right so uh, how to constrain these actions uh, through laws uh, is difficult because everything in the in the world of emotions and uh, wisdom cannot be quantified and written in equations in algorithms so we we our our lexicon is not uh, it doesn't span the entire space of our emotional intelligence and then uh, that way we cannot use these uh, these uh, axioms and man made axioms and uh, uh, logic to constrain what is unconstrained. <laughs> uh, so uh, this is the problem. Uh, but uh, to a certain extent, it can do that. For example, if you go to chat GPT right now, and then um, like uh, ask a very unethical question, uh, it will say, uh, no, I'm not going to answer that question because of these reasons. Uh, I mean, you anybody can try that. Like, so ask about uh, the personal life of somebody. I want to know. I want to know that personal story about that person. ChatGPT is programmed to say that uh, it is not a good conversation to have. Uh, so uh, it, it doesn't have information. No, it, my system is not updated. Then they, 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 it'll give a reason. Huh? It will give a reason because it knows it is unethical to talk about. Oh, so, right. the but they always say, I, my data is goes until... They, they give a good reason. Advanced, they you know? give a good reason. Uh, so the point is, uh, it has another layer that that has a, that works as a guard rail um, uh, that says, uh, okay, it is not good to talk about people's personal uh, life, even if the data is available. 
and then it gives some polite answer. So these things, uh, so it is like we call it uh, actor and a critic. Uh, so or, or um, um, uh, adversarial network. So there's a network, and then it it competes with another network, and that is trying to criticize the other network uh, or judge the other network. So these two networks can be trained to compete uh, with each other uh, to a level where the, uh, the 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 judging network is is more capable than the other network. Uh, so these uh, adversarial networks are uh, should be made a must in all AI systems. Uh, you have to prove that that judging network is 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 coupled with the other network. And then that uh, is should be transparent and what it can do, what it cannot do. And then what are the loopholes and then where things can go wrong and then a log of everything that went wrong. Uh, so this has to be made legal. It is not legal right now. Uh, so it is up to the maybe the standards committees, uh, IEEE is the major. Um, uh, it should get into that. And then the... As I said, the problem is we cannot program everything about ethics. Our 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 logic states and the language, uh, the words in any any language, is not enough to describe the right. So we have to discover vocabulary. So we we are limited in that sense. I check if there are any hands. Yeah, yeah, ju just just a second. You know, all this, right? I'm looking at you, Ali, because you talk about this ethical committee. What ethics exactly? Well, I mean, who, who are these ethicists? Are Christian ethicists? Are secular? Is, uh, an attempt to, to mind, sure. Such so, you know. Thank you, Amal. There, there was um, IEEE based in, uh, started in the United States, has 460,000 members all over the world. Uh, so, and we specifically did not want to just take a Western ethical view or the sort of Greek philosophic view of ethics. So there was a conscious attempt to look and take input from experts or at least read texts from experts on every continent and uh, major traditions, Buddhism, Christianity, Islam, Judaism, of course, but also Hinduism uh, and uh, Aboriginal religions and animism as well. So it, there was a, it was as ecumenical as it could have been. Oh, indeed, and I was just curious. It was yeah, yeah. Curious. There's definitely a desire, and uh, <laughs> just to emphasize the point, there are, there are mathematical reasons actually why justice uh, cannot be decided by an algorithm. So there there are actual limitations on this and proofs that we can give. So uh, it really points to the fact uh, that the let's put it in Buddhist terms the, the sangha is is really essential you need to have human oversight and human agency this is really just for the propagation of knowledge and a, a certain kind of efficiency in the same way that we might use a, a calculator <laughs> maybe more advanced but it, it's not going to replace uh, human ethical judgment the most comprehensive committee uh, in the world I know of. Um, but there's mathematical proof that mathematics is not complete. Uh, Gordel's incompleteness theorem, for example, um, it says any statement, you can you can write any statement in, in mathematics. And then you, whatever you were trying to describe uh, is larger than what you could end up describing. Uh, using uh, vocabulary or any kind of mathematics because it is a subset of what we knew. Uh, vocabulary in any culture is is a subset of the total wisdom. Uh, vocabulary doesn't totally uh, span the wisdom of that culture. 
and then there are certain cultures with uh, so much wisdom and then the limited vocabulary right so there's no one right south american some uh, tribes uh, living in uh, jungles uh, some people try to understand i mean there's huge wisdom but like very limited vocabulary because they don't trust uh, uh, give an example uh, somebody was trying to teach them how to count and then they took uh, pebbles and stones to okay there's one stone and then put two stones and then said this is two and then those people wow wow hold on like you know what like how do you say this is two is it this is two stones no no they are not identical <laughs> you cannot say they are two they are they are very different right so their wisdom is is a very in a different level uh and then that person who tried to teach them how to count realized <laughs> this this number system is too simple <laughs> uh so that is that is why we cannot constrain uh the ethics that is um, it is non linguistic uh non logical right so um, uh, and yeah just to, i think you're referring to uh, epistemology yes yes um but to sort of go back to the sort of uh, limitations um i think a lot of the focus so far has been on the software side of things and i just wanted to ask um what the potential future hardware developments might be with quantum computing this kind of thing Uh, because I, I do think right, when it comes back to consciousness as well, there is the limitation. You're basically feeding the machine instructions. It has set algorithms. It has set patterns. And this is why it doesn't have potentially as much agency because of the hardware. Yeah, I mean, um, uh, quantum computing is going to be very interesting. So I, I mean, that's why our community is very excited about uh the research happening especially at IBM and then uh, their breakthroughs quantum computing as i we how we understand it is is the only thing that can come close to uh our level of agency uh that level of computing uh, so multiple states happening at the same time and then uh um, i mean put the um said uh, so this this like you know his definition image right so it's like this states coming and rising and disappearing um these these things happen in very distributed way and then this is this is this is the, the, he did he didn't say quantum but like if you if you closely look at it 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 sounds like he was referring to things that are happening in a very intractable intractable level of complexity uh, so uh, in our body for example like you know our brain has 85 to 100 billion neurons and then all these things the synapses can you think about the number of permutations happening and then buddha said don't even try right so like what is important is not that what is important is uh, think about where the refuge is there that is not where your refuge is uh, it, it is the refuge is in the awareness right which is still all the time which is available all the time there's no gender to that there's no age to that this amaravati he said like you know ajara amara right so it is it is not born it is not going to die it is not going to decay think about that don't don't worry about these things that rise and pass away right so quantum computing will do that but not the awareness yeah uh mahinda and then we hong also yeah. yeah thank you so very interesting conversation uh, and as outsider to uh, this ai thing from coming from a buddhist and ethics perspective i have two issues one you know from a buddhist perspective can ai ever have volition volition is very important one for buddhism the intention to do 
And, and this is the critical one, I think, comes to uh, you know, all these things, where they ever, uh, rather than the consciousness, intention, you know, whether the mm -hmm. AI will have intention, is it possible to have intention? I think when the intention AI got it, I think it become more like humans or humans. So that question, whether it's possible to develop the science so that the AI get the volition or intention to do things. And this related to other issues, karma and everything. That's one thing. Other one is kind of as users, because one of the things that we rec recognize as important ability that human beings is discriminatory knowledge. You know, we, we are able to discriminate, you know, accurate from the wrong one, the right one from the wrong one or healthy one, unhealthy one. You know, that knowledge, like even the data, uh, say, for example, consciousness, there are two different, uh, now, Professor Nanakara mentioned about this, the how the consciousness is, kind of the six organs and the contact and so on. And then Yogacara has another viewpoint. Mm -hmm. Now, is it possible for us to develop AI to, to understand this discriminative knowledge? You know, in the Theravada tradition or the Pali tradition, we have a consciousness is defined this way. But in the Yogacara, it's defined that way. Like, or, or, or there are the alternative interpretations, like kind of uh, to make specific comments, accurate comments, and, and also to have specific ideas that we keen on the what they call truth, you know. So those are the two things, like whether AI could have a volition or intention, and that's very important for Buddhist uh, intention. And the other one is discriminatory knowledge, right from wrong, holes from the truth, especially today with disinformation today. You know, the young generation is going to be brainwashed because of this false information, because they won't have any clue what is true or value. And so we'll have just kind of uh, dead bodies walking on the street without really... Uh, ethical sensibility or, or intelligence or discrimination. So these are the kind of the thing that whether a, we can develop the AI on those two areas. Uh, I can follow in the discourse of uh, intention from uh, Mahinda. Uh, I will raise the more challenging the issue with AI arise when it makes certain judgment uh, uh, through self-learning or deep learning uh, that influence the human actions. Okay. Uh, from an ethical perspective, uh, perspective, the problem is when AI assists people in making judgments, how should we assess the moral responsibility? Okay. So in Buddhism, karma must include the motivation and of motivation or intention of the actor in if this motivation is influenced by ai how should we could how should we understand the karma generated by the person's agent i believe this is a question that buddhist philosophers need to address uh in theory uh karma is, is divided into the three categories of body, speech, and mind, uh, as I, I just mentioned above. Uh, in the scenario, if the actor's motivation is influenced by AI, can it still be con uh, still still be considered the, the actor's mental karma? I think this is a difficult issue to resolve because both ethics and Buddhism place a great emphasis on the motivation behind actions. Um, Buddhism in particular values the good karma generated by pure intentions. If the motivation is influenced by AI, the moral response, uh, responsibility of karma can, could become a major issue. The actor or the agent could easily say, oh, AI made me to do that. Okay. Well, this exempt them from the moral is a responsibility or karma. If Buddhism does not address this issue, the development of AI could challenge the Buddhist concept of karma. So I think 
uh, the in the discourse of the com uh philosophical discourse of intention is very important for Buddhist ethical thinking. That, that's my opinion. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you, and we are really going, we, we are already discussing how to make a Buddhist AI, and I'm very grateful, Ali, that you explained about this ethical committee, uh, and I would be really, really interested uh, to know more, um, because even when you talk about Buddhist ethics, um, it's, it's quite rich and also contradictory. Uh, yes, don't kill, don't lie, but then there is Upaya. Mm. And upaya, skillful means, uh, which means you can kill and you can lie and so on for a greater good. Uh, that's very simplified. So which ethics are you using, even within Buddhism? So that's something that I think if we want to use Buddhism as an example of a potential, as, as a venue of potential good values or... or uh, fruitful values for the future of AI, we also need to think within the sphere of Buddhist ethics, which kind of values or ideas we should use to create the background of this AI. So it's, it's, it's quite complicated and, compli and the, com the complex go beyond the idea of consciousness like we were discussing before. Um, and I would stay, only time I have, oh yes, Yell sometimes if you if I don't see you. But. So I come from life science background and practice uh, analytics. So uh, I just trying to share my observation. To you. So a lot of topics we discussed today centralize on humanity, Buddhism as a form of philosophy or wisdom. By its own definition, consciousness. Or belief, it's quite already confined the environment that how human beings believe, how Buddhism practice. That's why we recognize AI currently in the form of silicon. It will never mimic the way our brain works, mm. which means no matter how hard the silicon chip works, it will never meet all the humanity definition. So almost like a foregone conclusion that okay, whether we change AI have wisdom or or, uh, or consciousness, it will never match those definitions. But that said, I think all of us would recognize that AI can do something that human cannot, or with AI's help, we <coughs> do better. Fundamentally, we have limited neuron or atoms in our brain. Better or worse. <laughs> right or wrong, you know. That's how humanity, right, fight will use the tools for the good things rather than the bad things. But fundamentally, there's a limitation in our brain. One example would be playing Go, like Wei Qi. Then we would know until Alpha Zero come in, oh, we thought AI would never be human. But however, it'd be human by probably an order of magnitude. Then we realize actually the unknown philosophy, the human wisdom collectively accumulated for a thousand years, actually, you know what? We recognize the limitation. The same way we should recognize the limitation that no matter how well we practice Buddhism for a thousand years, gain probably the pinnacle of the wisdom of humanity. The tool they are out there for us to use, maybe they can do something good for us. For example, if somehow an LM can recognize all the sensory in the history and can talk to one of the most practiced Buddhists, maybe you will gain additional wisdom because there's limited memory or logic or manpower one human being can possess. Well, you can always add GPU with additional power. So what I'm trying to say here or make a comment is let's... I, I recognize Buddhism is actually the wisdom of humanity. No, no, no describe to other belief, but, but really this philosophy we practice for our lives to gain those wisdom or jiu through years of thousands years of humanity. But if we can use AI well, we probably can boost our understanding to a higher level. And uh, mm -hmm. that's all. <coughs> 
<clears throat> so if I understand correctly, you so say we should have a more positive view on AI as something helpful mm -hmm. rather than a challenge or an enemy. I might... Mm -hmm. Well, I, I I don't think that the people in this panel um, thought of AI as an, an enemy, but um, most of the people in the world look at AI with fear, as I said before, because it's, it's a kind of unknown, it's unknown to me. I mean, Trishanta speak, he's, he knows AI. Um, I don't. So people don't know AI. And they don't know the potential. They don't know how much. And there is also this, you know, kind of human-centered culture that we are here. Uh, and then humans need to keep control of this tool, even without knowing what the tool is about. Yeah. And, and that can be also uh, why humans have to be the moral right holder. And, why well, I would encourage everyone rather than to get fearful. Of oh, but we are not afraid. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. By virtue using it, yeah. actually contribute to the community. Exactly. Right. Better tool for us. But I, I agree. I think there is, um, there is, uh, as I said at the very, very beginning, this idea of AI as a tool, AI in partnership with humans, which is something that in East Asia is developing. Uh, I think maybe a little bit more than in other parts of the world. And I may be wrong here. I just speak from my own experience. But uh, in another research project, we have seen how uh, science fiction novelists have been writing with AI and producing fantastic work. You can have art pieces co-created with AI. And, and, and so it's a very more pragmatic and 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 if you like, bottom-up view of the use of AI. And I think that's the kind of perspective that we want to start from. So we are not afraid of AI. We recognize that is a tool that we, well, not definitely me, um, but people like Trishanta <laughs> invented. Um, and we can definitely, it's not just control, but use it as something positive. The question is how to build a sort of morality on an ethical system as a background that makes sure that AI can be fruitful and, and not dangerous. And not because we are afraid of AI. We may be afraid of some people who are controlling AI. Mm -hmm. Then at a certain time, you said Buddhism. I, I believe Buddhism is one of the many wisdom. But I also believe that there is a kind of common ground um, among different religious and, and philosophical traditions. That's why it would be very interesting to know the results of the committee that Ali was talking about. There are some background values, and I think that's what we should look at, something that is Buddhist, but also something that can speak to other cultures. And that's the way to create um, hardware, software, I don't know which one you decide, and that can be the basis of general hardware for all the AI to use. And I think that's what we try to explain here. Uh, we are not afraid. Yeah. Uh, I think, as I said, the, the, like we are tool makers, right? So we, we make these tools and we'll continue to make these tools. And then always in the, in the history of mankind, um, some tools have been discarded uh, due to, uh, you know, public public opinion like so at some point like cluster bombs were banned banned because it is not that we cannot make cluster bombs uh, the world no longer makes that because everybody through consensus people came to an understanding that uh, these are bad weapons and nuclear treaties and things like that it's not that technology is not that technology is there but like through consensus always our civilization found a way to steer away from danger. Uh, and AI will be the same. I mean, people always by nature are, are scared of the unknown. We are scared of the darkness because we don't know what is in the darkness. Um, so AI, for the people who don't know what AI is, like they are naturally scared. I totally understand that. People who are working in robotics and AI, we know that it is it is a simple toy. It is a it, 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 we know the limit of that, uh, and we are always on top of that. Uh, uh, the humans, and then our capacity is like 
is unlimited. Uh, I mean, our what we don't have is uh, our limitation is to combine various multiple millions of information at the same time to uh, make sense out of that. We will use AI as a tool to do that. That you know to fill our limitation. That, that's that's pretty much it. <coughs> Uh, I, I thank you. It's a very insightful thought, but I just uh, I just thought as a, speaking as a Buddhist and scholar, uh, you know, one, one of the things is advantages. Of course, we recognize the advantages, uh, but the most important is dangers or threats. You know, <clears throat> like anybody else, any Buddhist or any religious person is concerned about what the new technology does and its impact, mm -hmm. and of course. Wikipedia is a good example. You know, some of the things written about Buddhism or anything may not be accurate. So now the danger for Buddhists is actually is where this your project on available the digital text is important is to uh, distortion because distortion is the worst thing can happen. And uh, at at this stage now, AI the information is very limited, and it may not be representative of true, true accurate idea. So the potential for distortion is much higher in this technology as mm -hmm. it's available. Mm -hmm. So that's the danger for any religious person, practitioner or anything, yeah. even for a young person, because uh, the, the, the ac accuracy is, is, has not been the foundational or representation yeah. or or transferability or, or or you know kind of avoiding plagiarism all of these issues are there but the threat is the distortion you know kind of whether the doctrines are like karma for example yeah. we mentioned here mm. karma is a very complex doctrine very complex doctrine and even with buddhist society there are various views mm. but we can you know kind of in the Bud in the buddhist word in pali canon you can see his intention Karma is the intention. Uh, so the uh, speech, body, or whatever, it is intention which shapes it. So there are significant variation as text, textual scholars or Buddhist scholars. You could see even these words like karma, dependent origination. There are layers of meaning in various cultures. And I, I question, even within 10 years or 20 years, whether AI will be able to have a knowledge of it and communicate that. So what we get from AI now is a very basic, very, uh, I would say, I should mention it. It, it. it makes me happy. You know, AI gives me what I want to hear, you know, it, like, a, it, like going to the McDonald's or somewhere, you know, kind of very quick, instant gratification, you know, they, at the moment. I mean, I'm very happy the photos they produce for me. But it's instant gratification, and that's actually, I think, uh, the, where the ethical responsibility, legal responsibility lies, I think. And also the spiritually distortion. And this could be seen as a threat uh, to Buddhism, because if the ideas are misinterpreted, distorted, then you will not get into uh, the ultimate one, Bodhi. Mm -hmm. the enlightenment and awakening so that's kind of the concern i have at that at this stage yeah i think buddha saw that coming <laughs> and then in the in the before uh, passing away in the i think in the mahaparinibbana sutta he says don't believe anything if even if somebody says that buddha said that mm -hmm. uh, and yeah, yeah, so uh, like question yourself and then what he's what he kind of said was like Buddhism is very natural. It should it should be natural to you, and it if you if you feel that it doesn't quite fit well with your experience, it is not what I said. <laughs> so Buddhism fits well with your experience, right? So and if you intuitively don't feel that this is not right, it's very very. Likely, it is not what Buddha said. So people can try to distort, but people it's should. Not, it's not yeah, yeah. people trying to distort it. The system is incapable of yeah. uh, mm -hmm. uh, to provide in contradictory opinions mm -hmm. and and the change of subtle changes, linguistic yes, linguistic yes, changes, yeah. Yeah. and yeah. also I think this idea 
these ideas are loaded terms and, yeah, 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 and it's very exactly, not yeah. hard not easy to translate into language right, right, right. and i think ai is incapable at the moment that's why i mean that's why i think it has to move i think it to, should that is why i think ai um, the, there's a safety uh, valve there uh, everything is driven by market forces and then ai will settle down to that uh, that peripheral entry level um, discussions like uh like mindfulness music and um, uh, very entry level discussions about buddhism basic level One basic it buddhism. won't go beyond that even if somebody tries to do that as a market it won't survive mm-hmm. huh. uh, so over time it will be filtered out so just my response to the harm of ai i would like to try to simplify the answer as we speak of ethics um we would we would discover that in the buddhist precepts or sila um no matter how many there are it all comes down to one rule do not cause harm right and so how we actually define that harm can i uh, ask uh, stefania to help me play the last video on my uh, slide the second last one with the the yellow robot keep going keep going yeah, so uh, basically the idea is this you live in the world that you create so every day, the world you're living actually mirrors your body, mind, and speech. So if you click on that, yes. Okay. So imagine this, okay? <laughs> as we speak of deep learning, as we speak of creation, um, this AI is simply learning what we're teaching it, okay? And it's up to us to recognize the harm and the problems within that because it itself, not, it, it itself is not called, uh, let's finish, just a, just a robot. Yes, just that cooking robot itself is not causing harm. It's what we pass on to it. It's as simple as that. And so as we follow the system of this this method of deep learning, you will need to understand no matter whether you're a Buddhist or not, when you're not happy, when you're not at peace with what you have created, it is harm. So it is up to us to have awareness within the human mind in our in the part of our creation to understand what not causing harm actually means to the whole of humanity. Okay, that's all I would like to say. Thank you. In Buddhism, the important practice is mindfulness. When we practice mindfulness, mind uh, aware about our consciousness, whatever arises in the mind, then if we are not aware, the mindfulness is the practice uh, uh, awareness of the present moment, what is going on in us at the present moment. If we are not aware, mind becomes victim of our consciousness. If we become victim of our Consciousness, we create negative consciousness, maybe negative feelings, something pasapacha vedana, then we go on and on and we create karma, chetana, because mind becomes victim of our consciousness. Therefore, Buddha said, be mindful. That means we should be aware about the present moment, what is going on in us when we perceive uh, something uh, after the perception, consciousness arises. Therefore, um, mindfulness practice is very helpful for this uh, 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 this uh, AI, right? Um, so, therefore, um, uh, the consciousness when they arise, we can transform to spiritual level according to our practice and knowledge. We can transform to supramundane level or transcendence level. Then people, sometimes we don't know, some people are suffering due to the same object. They experience consciousness and they undergo the suffering. But some people, those who have practiced and cultivated the spiritual things, they are not victim of the object. Therefore, Buddha said, the transcend our mind. So therefore, um, the, when we develop awareness, when we practice mindfulness, our, our intelligence, our awareness is more acute and become more sharp. So therefore, the Buddha had extrasensory perception. 
What does extrasensory, extrasensory perception mean uh, in Parliament is Abhinya. We don't have that extrasensory perception. Through practice meditation, Buddha had developed uh, the knowledge of the previous lives of others and the knowledge about the next life, etc., telepathy powers. So therefore, practice of mindfulness, very helpful this uh, artificial intelligence to understand um, what is this artificial intelligence to understand our, our knowledge. So therefore, uh, the perception level and consciousness level and uh, wisdom level, three levels. First level is uh, sanya. Sanya means just, uh, just uh, perceive the object. It is not very uh, deep-rooted uh, understanding. But the second level is vijnana, as you said. The vijnana is, has a, 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 some kind of knowledge. And the third level is wisdom. That is the Buddha said, wisdom is understand whatever we perceive, they are impermanent, they are non-self. There is no uh, uh, permanent things. That is the wisdom level. So therefore, important to practice mindfulness, to go through this uh, artificial intelligence, we can have some kind of spiritual perspective according to Buddhism, what this um, uh, artificial intelligence can be used for our spiritual level. Thank you. How can I say no? <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I just want to kind of just focus on something slightly different with this being psoas. Um, there's, there's a lot of discussion about the sort of uh, holistic sort of, dare I say, applications of such an AI, <laughs> which would address a sort of person's individual needs and feelings and, and difficulties in their life in relation and how Buddhism can sort of help with that. Obviously, these, these sort of AI or LLMs or these same models, you can't really use them as citations in academia if they have a different focus. <clears throat> so is, is there going to be a sort of divergence or a separation where you have Buddhism AI yes. for academia mm -hmm. and Buddhism AI is for practitioners and followers? Mm -hmm. and, and what about the conflict between the two? Mm -hmm. Uh, academia. You are also yeah, academia. Also. <laughs> yeah, well, from my point of view, um, the practice is what is most important. Uh, so, I mean, scholarly arguments can be, um, yeah, we can endlessly debate about these things. Uh, if we, if we talk about Buddhism from an intellectual, very rational. Uh, level arguments can be endless so um, i prefer to sit down <laughs> and then you know look at my own mind and then ex through experience understand what buddha said then uh, trying to understand what buddha said through through a book uh, uh, so uh, I mean, that is what I did. I mean, just sitting under a tree or uh, in a, in a, it, I understood uh, something that I didn't really feel or experience throughout my entire life being as a Buddhist, growing up as a Buddhist life. So it is so intuitive, so so accessible. And then I think that is what people should be doing. And then it, it transforms you and it helps you. Uh, otherwise, intellectual knowledge uh, is good. It's, it's, it looks uh, very, very great, but it is not useful. Uh, it is not going to change you as who you are and how you view the world. And then, uh, for example, like I, I can, I, I, I may know about 
how a tesla car works but if i don't have a tesla car right so uh, it doesn't mean anything <laughs> so i'm not experiencing it or i'm not testing it. i think i think uh, one of my uh, meditation masters said it's unfortunate to be a coffee cup it doesn't uh, it holds coffee but it has never tasted coffee <laughs> so you can be a container for buddhist knowledge mm-hmm. uh, all these citations and everything but without ever tasting buddhism so it's very unfortunate uh, oh, thank you ai ai as a tool for buddhist studies uh, buddhist intellectual studies uh that would be great or whatever all what uh, venerable mio huang and others have said about digitization for instance uh that sh- that's how ai interact with intellectual world but if you look at ai as a tool a partner in more general sense i think it would be helpful to have values that go beyond intellectual values intellectuals can help and listing those values in uh collaboration and dialogue with practitioner that actually know those values for a longer time and in a different way because we're talking about application here so not just critical knowledge so i think there are very different spheres but these are all uh communities that could interact in order to have a very meaningful understanding in relation to this in japan in particular there's many sort of new religions yeah and a lot of them sort of take aspects of Buddhism, incorporate them into the, their sort of belief systems. You know, Nietzsche, Nietzscheanism is a, a very prominent one. Some of these groups uh, are quite controversial in, in the negative impact they can actually have on people's lives uh, financially. Uh, and this doesn't just apply to, to Buddhism. To Buddhism, it applies to other... Or to Japan, yeah. Yeah, other religious groups, similar... Sort of, if if these groups also develop AI, how do you? And that that's the point. Yeah. That's the point that uh, is so, uh, we discussed how Buddhists have been using AI. Uh, what Buddhists think about AI? What Venerable Myanmar once said: that "Don't cause harm." That should be the very first um, principle that Buddhist, and not just Buddhist, uh, should think of when they use AI. Um, but the thing is how to make ai based on a background on a, of wisdom that could be buddhist could be and should be buddhist and also more universal to avoid problems like this and then what you describe is i have to say um i teach chinese buddhism the very first thing uh, that i say to my students is chinese buddhism is very chinese and then you find a little bit of buddhism and so what well, <laughs> if we think of buddhism as indian pali buddhism so and that, so buddhism is really like it's very localized so you this merging of tradition i'm just back from field work in china i mean i have stories to say about this mixture of traditions and practices is something very much universal and not just buddhist uh, and of course you can always find even secular groups not necessarily just religious group who want to take advantage um and and and, and if those groups have a, a, um, a powerful AI in their hands. That's where the problem starts. So the point of discussing how to make a Buddhist AI was not to say that everyone has to become Buddhist or AI has to become Buddhist, but whether or not we can find within Buddhism, and that's why we have um, practitioners and scholars here, um, we could find the sort of... A, some values, something that could be translated into algorithm. And now I look at I look at Ali, I look at Trishanta, uh, because I don't know how to I don't know even how to spell algorithm, and how that can become the basis of something really meaningful here. The problem is, if you ask me, if I have to be very uh, candid here, I I believe not many people are willing to have this very fruitful, peaceful, not harmful form of AI because the AI industry is at the end of the day very much market driven 
as Trishanta said. So that's another obstacle, if you like. So I'm not really afraid of AI. I'm more afraid of this market-driven industry of AI. And then think of how collectively we could make a change to it because at the very end of the day, we created these tools, like all the other tools, mm. not to go back to what Umberto Eco said, but, you know, there are machines and the interface between machines and and, and humans, this is, is has been the basis of all, all humans and other species at the very beginning has been the basis of everything here. So let's have not fear, not, you know, um, uh, not feeling as a threat, not hate AI, but think of it in a different way. So the East Asian lesson of partnership with AI, I Ooh. think is, is somehow is quite helpful here. Yeah as a new framework, new uh, mind frame to rethink AI. And that is my humble viewpoint. Then I can pass my article to you where I did all this intellectual <laughs> thing about that, that it was, was not really in order to create a mindful AI. It was a way to, was a very different thing. Um, we are going towards the end. I see very sad faces here. <laughs> I am sad. Well, I mean, I'm, I'm just really grateful to our speakers, but I would love to, um, to and I mean, we, we discussed a lot. Uh, we saw so much application of AI in Buddhism. We saw how Buddhists have been thinking of advantages, disadvantages of AI, and this has been discussed, and how we, we start talking about what I saw, the list of values. I don't like to talk about ethics because I think it's, it's a kind of heavy word. And, and most of the time when you find ethics somewhere, it's always Western frame, human frame, that particular historical period. Not, not in the case of that committee, but mostly. Uh, what kind of values can we take out from Buddhism? And that could be a starting point uh, for a next meeting, a next event. We did on... Um, I never thought we were going to create a Buddhist AI, but I, we, I thought, and, and I see we did. We, we had the, a nice conversation, and, and I'm very grateful to all the questions and comments coming from the audience because this is a, is a collective um, dialogue, because this is a collective thing that we are discussing. So my uh, kind of to end in a positive note, if all our each of our speakers can just mention one value coming from the Buddhist wisdom that could be taken in account by ethical committees, by the creator of AI, uh, as a sort of beginning of framework. And in, in, in the next meeting, we can start from there and see where we go. And I would invite us, anyone from the audience to raise their hand and said what they think, good value, uh, what is good, what is bad, but you know, value that could be helpful uh, to make up a sort of a mapping of uh, more than a list, I would say a map. Uh, don't cause harm is one thing, but then I want to say a second one. Uh, that's what I would like to repeat, actually. Yes, Stick please. Just the one, do not cause harm. Thank you. I think I, I, I will, you can you can mention two if you don't know which one to choose. Yeah, I I will say respect and responsibility. Uh -huh. Respect and responsibility. But I, I think uh, I totally agree. Uh, don't cause harm. Uh, harm means harm. If you harm other people, it'll come back to you at some point. Uh, because uh, we are living in this society, you cannot poison the society and expect you to be happy in the long run. Uh, the society will come back to you. You are a part of the whole thing. So don't cause harm to the society. Uh, don't ca cause harm to yourself. And then take responsibility for all the actions you are taking, doing. And don't cause harm. It's, it, se it seems like a, a very easy, it's very difficult not to cause harm. We cause harm every day. Uh, you don't need to kill someone to cause harm. Uh, so it's very easy to cause harm. So I think it's a, it's a very important value and very difficult also 
to be translated probably. Wait okay. Uh, I would like to say, uh, considering the karma and make our life better. Thank you. Karma, yeah. Also, please. Uh, reaction and respond are two things. Reaction is made on two things. But respond is after consideration you respond. Then we can minimize the harm. Respond, do yeah. not react. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Anyone else? Yes, Venerable, please. So, where is no. Which apparently will be very difficult for AI to embody, but. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yes? Well, AI or computers are quite hungry in energy. Mm -hmm. So maybe uh, solar powered servers, mm -hmm. <laughs> just purely for Buddhist AI. <laughs> uh, sorry, what? No, for purely for Buddhist AI, you have just solar panels powering a circle, and that's the access. Environmental friendly. Yeah. Be kind to the environment. Well, uh, AI uh, claim to be environmental friendly. Uh, no. Well, do, okay. Uh, some articles I read. <laughs> AI claim to be uh, not AI. People claim the, that AI the training uh, Chat GPT uh, LLM um, is uh, said to be equivalent to uh, like four years of driving very polluting cars. Uh, you know, along the I don't know the exact number. It is a massive pollution. Um, uh, Bitcoin, for example, like you know, causing a lot of uh, so. A, for the AI community, don't uh, run inefficient inefficient algorithms in computers. You are killing the planet. Uh, so you know, think before running anything. Like you know, just don't throw garbage, uh, and then expect some miracle to happen. So think before doing these things. Right? And just... since uh, I mean, I would be very happy to pass my readings to you, Trishanta. I know what <laughs> what I'm reading is actually. Uh, valid or not, that AI, or at least scholars have been claiming that AI is more inclusive than humans, or can be more inclusive. Do you agree with that? Uh, um, uh, the AI will definitely democratize information. Okay. Uh, so uh, uh, it'll, it'll uh, democratize legal profession, it'll democratize medicine. So many examples are there. Right, you know, early diagnosis of uh, so many diseases uh, for sure uh, to do with computing. Um, uh, about AI being fair, uh, I don't know. Uh, so because it is very market driven, and then AI will very likely bias people who are uh, who have the money to pay for these services, like even Chat GPT. There's a free version. There's a paid version. And then the tiered way of uh, doing that. And then people who can pay like $40 a month, uh, they will get a different service. And then their capabilities are suddenly bigger than the other people and other people cannot compete with them. Their people's efficiency will be very different. Right? Uh, so it is not going to be fair. It's, it's, a, it's driven by market forces. Capitalism. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's it. That's, that's how it is. So since AI has been reshaping Buddhism uh, a little bit, and not necessarily in a bad way, my question is, are we confident that Buddhism as form of wisdom of values could also reshape AI? Yes. Do you think there is this? Um, it will all, all of you, not reshape, uh, in my opinion, if people, people in large numbers feel that it is beneficial. Uh, so it is up to the global community, right? So the consumers uh, to decide, uh, you know, how AI should be working, right? Uh, for example, in Amazon Prime, 
uh, people who are buying things like, I would want it to be delivered tomorrow. I don't really care. I click it and then it should be on my doorstep tomorrow. And then these massive AI algorithms have to source it from wherever in the planet and then plan the best routing, uh, the flight and then all those booking, all the all the all the flights and DHL or whatever. They make sure it will be delivered to your doorstep tomorrow and you pay for it. Um and then uh, the the amount of uh, pollution, the carbon footprint, nobody cares. Right? It is it is driven by that demand, right? So to be delivered tomorrow, and then the packing and everything, the all the material, the wastage and all that. It is like I, that's why I think it is the demand is created by the people. People think about what you are doing. <laughs> And then what kind of demand you are creating, and then when when it is multiplied by billions, market forces are tsunamis, and then commercial companies respond to that. So it is just up to us to think about how how we behave as commercial beings. Exactly. So I think uh, we all agree that is a it's, this is an important conversation. This is a difficult conversation. To repeat what Graham said at the very beginning, and I think we all agree that it would be important to have a follow up of this conversation, maybe also including on this stage uh, those people who are really involved in making certain decision when it comes to AI. And then I think it would be mm -hmm. a step forward um, to the possibility to have an AI informed by Buddhism, but let's say informed by values that can make it and helpful partner in an harmonious life. I could not be more Chinese than that. <laughs> I would use this opportunity for a no more, don't see any hands. So, and we are ready uh, a little bit. Uh, yes, uh, we, we already got, went over at 6.30, so I hope it's not a problem for the people here. I wanna thank again, our speakers for being so generous in sharing ideas, in preparing. We, we have been brainstorming together, exchanging emails, creating a PowerPoint all together. So I'm really, really grateful. I'm extremely grateful to all the people in the audience, the venerables, the London Buddhist Vihara, the uh, the British Mahabodhi Society for partnering. So that's a partnership, is it? <laughs> that can work. And to 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 create this event and, and let's do that again uh, soon, sooner rather than later. And last but not least, uh, not last, uh, there is something that I want to say at the very end. I want to thank again our sponsor, Kente Foundation, for make possible of everyone to be here and for all of us to be here and discuss this. We are extremely grateful and, and for all the support that we have received so far and especially for today. Um, I want to end by thanks, Graham, for being here and open. And Haruka, there are a number of people that are you know, behind the scenes that you may not see, but have been doing lots of work. And and Haruka Saito is a PhD student of us and is also the um, center assistant, assistant admin, administrative assistant. I don't know exactly what, but she does lots of stuff. Um, so she has been working a lot. She's just back from Japan and fighting jet lag, but she's, she's here. And I also want to thank Sunil up there, who is doing the recording and and, and, and the people of the catering were not here, but I will thank them via email for being also part of the success of this event. I know that, uh, Venerable, you want to... Uh, yes, um, thank you for thanking everyone. Thank you for thanking us. And I would like to also hold on to this opportunity to express my gratitude for Fo Guangshan and all the members of the temple and the... Um, uh, and so um, in order for us to say thank you, we've brought uh, forward a few tokens of appreciation for Graham, uh, for Stefania, and also for our panelists. So we would like to use this opportunity to present the gift to you. So if I could invite Venerable Miao Duo, uh, the abbess of Fo Guangshan London, to help us present a scroll of the Heart Sutra, or the secrets to the heart that help us to be good. Uh, if we could um, ask Venerable Miao Duo to first present this to Graham.
hot And also, we must give one to Stefania for making today happen. It's been a truly meaningful event. So this is the Guanin and the Hatsu Tries a calligraphy by the founder. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. We just bought the house, so. Oh. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And just to quickly, um, the gifts of books to our panelists. For you, the Buddha Dharma Pure is important. The very last. Uh, is that uh, an invitation? That Venerable Miao Guang is going to give us a talk tomorrow afternoon in our temple. So, everyone here are welcome to come. So, the lecture talk will be uh, conducted in English and uh, start at uh, three o'clock. So, please come and join us. Thank you very much. And before I let you go, it's a custom at the Center of Buddhist Studies to advertise the next event. As I said, we are going to have a very, very rich calendar this year. And uh, those who are students or members of staff, but also think the, uh, the, uh, the members, um, the mailing list, have received already um, the list of the events and the dates. And those of you who are not in the mailing list of the Center of Buddhist Studies, please go to the web page. You go on Google Source, the Center of Buddhist Studies, and you will get the page and you scroll down. And a certain point is join the mailing list or something like that. You click there, you put your email address, and then anytime we have an event, uh, you're going to receive announcement of that. The next one, I have a poster. The next one um, will be on the 14th of November, 5.30 to 7, and room... B304, which is the Brunei Gallery, the building just in front of us, is a Buddhist forum also sponsored by Cancer Foundation. And the Professor Mahoyuchi is going to talk about transformation of Kadampa monasteries in early Tibet. Uh, so and it's, a, it's, it's a lecture, so it's not going to be a one-day event. Uh, it's a lecture of one hour and a half. We're going to have a uh, wine reception afterwards, everyone is invited. And like for the Buddhism Inside Out, all these events are free and open to everyone. Um, and even if you are not an intellectual or a student of SOAS or a student of Buddhism, please come because any little piece will help you to understand better this tradition. And again, my gratitude to Cancer Foundation for also making this other event possible. And I think we have another one in December coming up, we will be announcing in November, that is also a Buddhist forum sponsored by Cancer Foundation. Thank you everyone again. Have a lovely rest of the weekend. <laughs>